It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We get ready for the international CES show, which kicks off tonight. Brian Brushwood's here, Dan Patterson, and Trey Ratcliffe. We'll talk about what's next with cameras, TVs, cars, and more. Twit is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 439, recorded January 5th, 2014. Fist like monkey. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Stamps.com. Start using your time more effectively with Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone, and enter Twit. And buy FreshBooks, the simple cloud accounting solution that helps thousands of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time, billing, and get paid faster. Try it for free for 30 days at GetFreshBooks.com and join over 5 million users running their business with ease. And buy audible.com sign up for the platinum plan and get two free books visit audible.com slash twit2 and don't forget to follow audible on twitter user id audible underscore com and by gazelle the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets find out what your used iphone ipad or other products are worth at gazelle.com it's time for twit this week in tech the show that uh, takes all the tech news of the week and mushes it up and Put some pretty bright minds on it to try to analyze it and figure it all out. We've got a great team here. We're going to go all the way to New Zealand for one of my oldest, dearest friends, Trey Ratcliffe, the brilliant photographer who is in tomorrow. He's stuck in customs.com. Trey, great to see you again. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? And hey, Brian. Hey, Dan. Hey, everybody. I'm great. Hey, great to have you. Brian Brushwood. I'm terrible. He's got shingles. <laughs> He's got the pox, literally. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I see. We're just going to bring out my herpes right at yeah, the Yeah, right at the herpes zoster, baby. <laughs> this is actually no, uh, not to be laughed at. In fact, you've inspired me and everybody over uh -oh. 50 to get a herpes, uh, to get a, a shingles shot because there is a vaccine. It won't prevent it, but it does reduce the... Uh, the yeah, well, and I got to be honest, like, it's not anything, uh, uh, by the way, it's just chicken pox, if you guys are freaking out. Like, brush was got herpes, put it on his But chicken pox never <laughs> goes away. It, it, it's a systemic virus that continues the rest of your life, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and uh, in this case, like, I just noticed that my left side was sore, and I went to the doctor, and uh, there was a news story that's saying if you got shingles before 40, you were at, like, some raised risk for a stroke down the right. road. And I was like, wow, I don't know what shingles are. Wow, that sounds like that pain on my left side. So I went to the doctor, oh, no. and I start describing, and he's like, well, let's take a look. at Oh, those are shingles. <laughs> <laughs> Holy so Kamali. this will be... I, I, I uh, this will be notable as the single episode of this week in tech's uh, tech where I'm highest as a kite. So enjoy my insight. Really, what do they give you? Uh, I don't know. I, I got a little. Maybe Vicodin. I shouldn't get that Does shot. That do anything for you? Vicodin. There you go. You are you are you really you're on Vicodin right now? I'm on, I'm on Vicodin <laughs> and anti herpes medicine. No. So Valtrex. it's painful. What you're saying is very painful. Um, yeah, no, it, it sucks. I don't wow. recommend it. If you have the means, don't get shingles. <laughs> oh, I hope you're. I uh, yeah. I hope you're feeling better. And uh, ah, whatever. you were a superstar. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, a couple of uh, days ago. I was. Ago. And now yeah. look at me. I have shingles and I'm on shingles. herpes meds. <laughs> By the way, it is not an STD, okay? <laughs> it's a childhood disease. Get that right. Also with us, Dan you Patterson from, uh, well, I got to get a new company, Tanuki Labs. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Hey, it's great to be here. Since you were here last, Dan, uh, of course, a longtime uh, radio uh, journalist. Um, he for uh, the last time you were here, you were at Some All, uh, Dane Atkinson's yep. company, uh, but still doing journalism. And now you're at Tanuki. What's Tanuki? So Tanuki is an incubator here in the New York City uh, tech ecosystem. We build things. So uh, primarily with the uh, Ruby, some Node.js, oh, HTML5, uh, and and they are kind enough to allow me to continue scratching my journalism itch concurrently with uh, doing some deep tech with them. So uh, I will be traveling to the Middle East and uh, using. Uh, a lot of things that we've learned, particularly on security now with Steve Gibson, uh, many security tactics to uh, reporters in the Middle East. We want to be a little discreet with the countries that we're visiting, but uh, we're we're teaching things like PGP encryption uh, oh, and secure communication best practices. This seems to be a trend. I mean, I look at Robert Scoble at Rackspace. He's, you know, he is a journalist 
working within Rackspace. And I think more and more you're going to see companies uh, doing content, even if it doesn't relate exactly to what the company is about. Uh, I don't know because it's a it's good because it's a good thing. I don't know why. What's well, the it's percentage? Better to show in it? than to tell, right? right? So, so you know, with someone then continuing with with Tanuki, it's way better to say, "Here is the capability. Why don't you just see the capability of what we can do?" As opposed to us just giving you a traditional marketing pitch. Now, both can go concurrently. I fortunately don't have to touch the marketing angles, but for the most part, they, you know, a lot of companies are starting to see that the skills of journalism are directly applicable to the skills that uh, technology companies need, but also do a really good job. Of showing and not telling. Yeah. You did a, an amazing thing covering the uh, last presidential election on SoundCloud. You used Twitter. You've used Medium. Uh, I, th I think you used Storify, too, for the original yeah. Occupy Wall Street stuff. Yep. That's exciting. It's cool to see some, somebody needs to somewhere try new forms of journalism instead of doing the same old thing over and over again. Well, it's nice to have the uh, opportunity to participate in those forms of journalism, as well as here in the tech, uh, Twit family. Yay. We're glad to have you, Dan. Uh, so I do a little props. I, we'll get to the news in a second. But I just, you know, I got to acknowledge this. New Year's Eve, uh, a few days ago, what was it, uh, Wednesday, thir Tuesday and Wednesday. And Brian came up for it and did an amazing magic show, which I think you've posted. But we're about to post all the video from New Year's Eve on our yeah, Inside man. Twit. YouTube uh, um, channel. So be youtube.com slash inside twit. What a great time. 23 hour broadcast. Uh, we, we went all around the world. We, we, uh, train, we were hoping to have you in New Zealand, but we got very confused because New Zealand. No, I think there were a lot of people confused that night. I was out <laughs> taking photos. I got my new camera and I, I was all addicted out there and probably it, we, we both made a mistake. So don't worry about no, it. No, no, it's not your mistake. I think New Zealand honors saving daylight savings time. And I think we it would have had to be a 25-hour broadcast to have you or something like that. <laughs> anyway. No, it's like, remember that scene from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where yeah. he was actually his own grandfather because of a, a problem with a, a prophylactic and a time machine? <laughs> yes. That's what is it like down here. <laughs> it's, anyway, uh, good. Happy New Year to you. I'm sorry we didn't get you on, but uh, it's, it's great to talk to you uh, now. And thank you, Brian, for doing an amazing magic act. I was... I didn't, didn't want to tell you at the time, but once I saw the fire ascending to the roof, I was just praying that the sprinklers did not go off and drench <laughs> yeah. the whole studio. That's one of those things where, uh, luckily, in 15 years, we've never tripped a commercial alarm system. Oh that's kind of thing. You get, you get really good at analyzing what kind of system oh, so you, uh, everyone has. You oh, did sure, look. Sure, sure, Okay. Yeah. yeah. We did not screw America Samoa. We had American Samoa. We screwed Samoa. <laughs> There's a difference, okay? I just want everybody Leona to know. Samoa. We screwed regular Samoa because they were early, We but we got American Samoa. That was actually the last Happy New Year. I popped 30 bottles of Cook's Champagne at $6 a bottle, that, and they were Magnums, too. Uh, that was fun. We have champagne all over the studio, and I think there's still a residue of kerosene in the, in the carpet where I'm sitting from Brian's Maybe. Fire Act. It, uh, it evaporates pretty quick. There's probably fake blood almost certainly right underneath you. That's fake? That's right. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you, Leo. Oh, man, you magicians. Thought it was real blood. Do you use, Is that what you use in ex as, a, as an accelerant? What do you use? Kerosene? What? I, 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 naphtha, it's also called white gas or Coleman's camp fuel yeah. is the best. Uh, it burns bright and yellow. It's, of course, cancerous. Uh, but uh, the uh, once you've had it, shingles, it also, there's nothing to fear. <laughs> ah, whatever. It's all going downhill. I hope you enjoyed my last appearance on Twit. <laughs> Cancer is really. Uh, I'm sure everything is whatever. Yeah. But uh, but you know when, and what's funny is the conversation you have with your doctor when you decide to quit your tech job to do a bizarre magic show. And you sort of line by line, you're like, okay, look, you're not going to like any of the things I'm about to talk to you about. How horrified are you by? Let's start with fire eating. Drinking and, and naphtha. You, 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 yeah, you, you, you come up with like best practices about like, for example, on the naphtha thing, they don't worry about you swallowing it so much. They worry about you breathing it because oh. that's what is, is cancerous. And in fact, if someone swallows kerosene, they give them charcoal and they tell them not to induce vomiting because the fear is if you vomit, You'll it, breathe you it. may aspirate it. You, oh. Yeah, they're more worried about it getting in your lungs oh. than in your be belly. So all that oh. stuff. 
It's all about <laughs> mitigated risks. I'm in, I'm intrigued though that you actually went to a doctor. It doesn't feel like you really made that much planning, and so I'm I'm glad. I wonder how do you actually have you ever tried to like swallow charcoal? That sounds hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I believe well, that comes in pill form now. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So CES is next, uh, is a day, day, well, it starts tonight, really. CES unveiled in just a few hours. Robert Balasser is on his way down there to cover that for us. Um, you, None of you are going to CES, I take it. Thank God. Nope. Not negatory. so much. I would have loved to. I'll tell you what, the time that I, that I came down and joined you guys was really a lot of fun. And I can understand how to someone whose job is, is every year to go and see the same daily grind, like, you know, I go and I'm all excited, like, whoa, they're tasing people. And they're like, yeah, they do that every <laughs> yeah, year. every year. Boo. And so I'm, I'm kind of glad that I only got the one time before I saw how the sausage was made and got jaded. <laughs> it really is a measure of your status in the tech journalism field. When you're a young, up-and-coming pup, getting to go to CES is a big deal. It's like, I got this, I got the ticket, I got the, I'm going to CES, I'm so excited. And then when you get to be like Dvorak, it's like, I'll never go to CES again. And, and so that really is a way to, to determine where you stand on the tech scale. We are not going to be doing the Sky Booth that we've done. We didn't do it last year. We're not going to do it this year. But I'm really pleased to say uh, that Callie Lewis and GeekBeat TV will be uh, doing it along with um, Renee Ritchie of iMore.com and many others. They're actually taking our old booth spot, and they're going to do live wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I don't feel like we really need to do that anymore. It's so CES is so well covered. Saturated. There's no need to go. You can sit back, watch. I mean, everybody from Spike TV to USA Today to the Wall Street Journal to everybody's there. So I don't feel the need. And Gadget and uh, The Verge and uh, CNET all have giant, like they send 50 people down, giant staffs down there. So we're going to send uh, Father Robert Balasser, uh, the digital Jesuit. <laughs> we're going to send an old priest and a young priest. We're going to send... Uh, Dick Deed Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, and we're going to send Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy. And my charge to them is find the top 10 products or the top 20 products, whatever you, whatever that cutoff is where after that you don't really care. Because it's my position that probably there's no more than, say, 20 things that really matter at CES. Why don't we just focus on those and leave well, the vibrating the, the, forks The tough behind. thing also is to figure out like which are the ones that matter right you know, it's like and again i only really spent one year diving into it but it's amazing out of the 50 or so things that i really paid attention to maybe three of them have turned into something and that's the the big gamble right are you investing your time in something that's just going to be a giant waste or or are you having a conversation with the folks who are going to be maker bot you know it's hard to know and blow your right. minds two years it's later. almost and, impossible to know and why your own coverage matters right what in individually what is unique about your perspective and interpretation that really helps inform the audience if we put them number one right and we say the audience is what matters first how can we lend our unique perspective to this that really adds some insight to an otherwise very commodified news cycle boy that is exactly right dan what would you say is is the way to make ces coverage uh, worth something well, I answer the, the number one question of why this matters to you, right? right. I think Twitter, of course, has carved out a very unique spot in the tech industry, and there is literally a, a chorus of voices here that all have a very unique identity and perspective. But for for the most part, when we think about clickbait and, and the, the, the news beat, chart beat of the world driving instantaneous, hyper-optimized listicle traffic... <laughs> I don't, I don't do that. There's not a lot of unique voice there. <laughs> well, that, so for instance, there will be an infinite or very close to approaching infinite number of Bluetooth speakers at CES this year. It's a category that was pioneered by Jambox, and uh, that was a few years ago. And that was, you know, when, when, the first, when I got the first Jambox, that was, wow, this is great. Now there's 8,000 form factors. There's a million of them. I don't think that's worth covering at all. A Bluetooth speaker is a Bluetooth speaker, right? There, I'll tell you what, man. How, how hard would it be to totally gamify CES and have, like, actual gladiatorial combat? Where it's like everybody <laughs> makes an avatar. You hire the biggest, strongest, toughest guy you can. You know, it's like if you have the budget to be Sony, then, you know, you, you get one of the guys from the TV show or whatever. And they're just, just slaughtering each Fight other. Fight it out. Why not? That's a, very, that's a very South Park approach to this. My favorite thing about <laughs> CES is always the... Uh, I think it's all about the personalities that go and just putting really strong opinion into the products because 
We're also smart. We can just look at the top 10 products and we immediately right. can get categorize you know. and we know what it is. You know. We get it. Yeah. But like, you know, whenever you see Conan go or do something ridiculous or Lady I Gaga, like really strong opinion remember she was there with that sort of the, the flavor of it. Otherwise, it's just sort of like dry tech. This is so funny because what you really have here is three people with with the exact epitome of their personality saying this is what CES should be. Trey Rackliff was very humanistic, very focused on people. Says it's about the people. Uh, we got Dan Patterson saying it's about finding the right product and finding a unique voice. It's uh, Brian Brushwood saying there should be death and killing. <laughs> I'm saying it's about the big show. Embrace your destiny, CES. Make it about slaughter. <laughs> and that really is what CES is. It is an elephant with 19,000 blind men fondling its parts. <laughs> and you're trying to figure out what the hell am I looking at here? Well, and, and I'll tell you, a lot of this is kind of self, um, you have the marketplace of ideas. And in that regard, it's sort of self-polices because you got everybody who's making as big a noise as they can at the same time, which inherently is an odd way to do oh, things it's where it's like, let's oh. all try to shout at the same moment yeah. and have the cream rise to the top. But you have stuff like, you know, like Reddit, you can have a little tiny Oculus style product in the corner that somebody notices and 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 it just explodes because it's the right idea at the right time. So it's like, I mean, I understand why you have to have a CES and and I understand like you got to get all those same people in the same place. But the interpretation of that event, I think we're starting to virtualize as, as we have a lot of other experiences as well. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back, I wouldn't mind hearing from each of you what you look forward to. Trey, I mean, uh, cameras are a part of CES. I know you've recently just made the move uh, from a, being a Nikon guy to a Sony guy, and in particular, the new A7. I'm very interested in hearing your yep. take on that and what we might see from Sony and others at CES. Um, Dan Patterson's also here from Tanuki Labs and, of course, the great Brian Brushwood. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm hoping before this show is over we can give you a link where you'll be able to find Brian's amazing performance. You can go see the NSFW. The NSFW show we did there. It's a good one. Like, like normally, like NSFW has always been highly experimental, Leo, and I'm probably not the first to suggest that maybe sometimes we're hit, sometimes we're missed, but this was easily, I would show, I would show anybody this last episode as a representation of the best that, that we can be. I would, you know, I was stunned. I didn't realize it was a funny show. And <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the audience feels that way, Leo. <laughs> I think you actually, you know what happened? Because a lot of people were watching our coverage that don't know, normally watch NSFW. I think you actually did get a whole new bunch of people saying, like me, because I try not to watch NSFW because I don't want to have to cancel it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I try to avoid, you know, I just, I, it's caused plausible deniability. Plausible I deniability. I yeah. don't know what they did. What are you talking about? Um, but I was part of this show and it was about the funniest thing. I could not stop laughing. <laughs> I had so much fun. Uh, so it is uh, It is on twit.tv slash NSFW episode 211, our uh, New Year's show. Will Harris came out for that, and he is great. It was just a lot of fun. Will was in rare form. We got uh, we got Will singing a la uh, Johnny Cash. He did We got great. Uh, Leo alternately twerking and screaming like a goat and uh, uh and, and by the way i wasn't out of it or drunk or anything i just volunteered no 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 what you you're you're rocking it are you kidding me you killed it man it was great <laughs> i told i told jry afterwards i said thank you for not making me sing i could scream like a goat at the drop of a hat just thank you for not making me sing our show today brought to you by stamps.com uh we're you know i you probably see these giant mats that uh, I've got in front of me. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. This company called uh, Daniel came by from Maker Mat, and he's making these giant mats, and and he's going to mail them himself. And I said, uh, actually, I guess you're getting Amazon to do a lot of them, but to get the international mailing, he says, I will do it if I have to mail it myself. So I said, stamps.com. Stamps.com is for anybody who's doing fulfillment. Or maybe your business sends bills out, invoices, uh, mailers. Um, if you do mailing and you do it for a business, the last thing you want to do is go down to the post office to get postage or to mail stuff or have an employee do that. It's just not effective. Stamps.com maximizes every minute and every dollar for your small business. You don't even have to leave your desk to do everything, all the mailing stuff you need to do. Uh, in fact, really, it's a perfect synergy with the Postal Service because what does the Postal Service do best? They send a person to every single place in the entire country six days a week and they do pickup and they do delivery 
Let them do that, and you do the printing of the stamps, the printing of the on the envelopes, uh, printing on the packages, all at a fraction of the cost of expensive postage meters. Stamps.com saves you time, saves you money. You get discounts you cannot get at the post office. The mail carrier will come to you and pick up that. They, there's even a button on the Stamps.com site that says, have a carrier come out. I missed the pickup. Send another one. It really is convenient. Now, we've got a special no-risk trial offer. You probably saw that $80 offer on the front page. Don't take that. Click the radio microphone in the upper right-hand corner. Enter our offer code TWIT, and we, T-W-I-T, and we will give you a $110 bonus offer. You get a free USB scale that lets you just plop the letter or package on there and always have exactly the right postage. You get uh, a $5 uh, supply kit. That take, kind of makes up for the shipping and handling on the USB scale. You get a $55 in free postage. That's a good deal. Plus a month of stamps.com. I mean, I, really, this is a no-risk trial. There's no reason not to do it. And by the way, you cancel any time. This scale's yours to keep. Stamps.com, before you do anything else, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in TWIT. That's stamps.com, offer code TWIT. We love it. This week in tech, the pre-CES edition. I'm going down there tomorrow for the New Media Expo, and I'm going to get out before CES. But I thought what I would do is I would be, you know, everybody has to do this. Uh, somebody has to do this every year. Uh, I'm going to be patient zero. Bring the cold to CES so that everybody can have it when they come back. <laughs> Usually I get sick afterwards. I thought I'd get sick beforehand. Ugh. You're just going to own it. I like it. I'm going to own it. I, I guess I should wear, you know, masks and stuff like that. I don't. I'll tell you what, you know, I, I did this um, this TV special in Indonesia a couple of years ago, and I was amazed at, like, when you go to the fashion boutiques at the mall, they have, like, fashionable masks. Oh. And I don't know if it was to keep the pollution out or your disease in or what, but apparently America's really lagging on the adorable teddy bear disease masks. I thought that uh, somebody told me that it was to keep the disease from emerging from you. It's not to protect yourself. It's if you're sick, you wear them. It's considered in Asian yeah, it's countries. Be polite. Polite. When you go, Leo. You should wear not a, a mask, but you should wear one of those cones like a neuter dog wear. <laughs> so you can eject it. That way, nobody could kiss me. Yeah. Oh, oh, I get it. Like an amplification union. Yeah. 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 Then people will stay away. You'll have this cone of silence in front of you. I wonder if I could get. Is it too late to get a Bane mask? Your your uh, CES amazes me. You just walk around. <laughs> I would love it. Okay, I mean, how much would you love to go under the knife and the doctor's wearing a Bane mask? Oh, to get, God, that'd I'm, be scary. I'm just keeping my diseases in, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. So, so, Trey Ratcliffe, I know cameras, uh, there are other events that cameras get shown, but it does seem to be that Nikon, Canon, Sony, uh, Casio, Pentax, they all go to CES. Do you expect any camera action? Well, these guys, they always announce stuff ahead of time, usually not at CES. Uh, but, you know, for years, I've been lambasted for getting on this sort of mirrorless bandwagon. And, uh, uh, yeah, I've been a convert from uh, Nikon to, as they say here, Nikon to Sony uh, for about the last two years. And now that they came out with this new mirrorless camera. You love I mean, that, don't you? Super exciting. Yeah. Samsung will show a uh, successor to its Galaxy camera. So it's like a Galaxy S4 glommed onto a camera, uh, reportedly with better uh, imaging. I think this is a big trend, is computational photography. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's, now it's uh, walk me through because this. Because so much I, stuff happens I, I, in the software now. Right. Yeah, so, so walk me through this, because I hear, I hear talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, digital enhancement where they're able to take less information but, but enhance it up to a higher resolution. Like, uh, pretend... I'm an idiot magician who eats fire for a living and describe to me why I should be excited about this. Okay. I'm putting myself into that mind space. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, let me, let's take a step back here. I've got, I've got some visual aids here. Um, this is a, let's, let's set the framework of the conversation. Okay. This is a, look at that ugly thing. This is a big old DSLR Nikon. Okay, this is what I shot with for years and years. And it by weighs. The way, I'm not sponsored by Sony or anything. No, no, no nobody sponsors you. This this thing weighs like five pounds. I mean, it's really heavy. Oh no, it's huge. Look, I've got this huge like leather horse bridle attached to it. It's so heavy, so I can carry the thing around. It's ridiculous. Okay, so let's compare this to the new Sony A7R, this mirrorless camera. Wow. Look at the size difference. Wow. Now, they're both full frame sensors. 
This one is 36 megapixel full frame sensor. So as opposed to that camera you just mentioned, uh, the, the small Samsung drums, those are very tiny sensors, very, very tiny. And the importance of having a big sensor is low light or like dark photography, which you can argue is most of your photography, 50, 60, 70% of your shots are probably taken like indoors or low light. So having a nice big sensor is super important. So not only is the camera smaller, but the lenses are smaller. And like you mentioned with computational photography, there's so many smarts now inside of this camera with the optical viewfinder and the amount of stuff it can figure out. Like not only has, you know, face detection's been around forever, right? We see a little square on the face, but they've taken the next step with this and now it has eye detection. And so you know this, uh, since you're a photographer to Leo, that when you want to take a photo of somebody's face and they're kind of turned to the side, if you can focus on something, get some shallow depth of field action, you want to, you want to focus on their closest eye. So the idea that this can just computationally figure out where their closest eye is and autofocus right there, I mean, that's kind of a game changer. But does a pro like you eschew that kind of thing? I mean, don't you say, hey, I'm a professional. I know where the closest eye is. I, do, do you really use that? I mean, don't you, can't you just do that? I mean, I understand well, for grandma, that's great. But really, you need that? No, no. I think, uh, I think any pro, like, quote, pro, that eschews technology just because they like to be old school and manual, I, I don't think that's very open-minded. And you do see that attitude from a lot of photographers, sadly. Yeah. But the, the, tech, the reason that you're paying, you know, a couple thousand dollars for this is not so that you can operate it like an old reflex camera with flash powder. It's so that you can, you're buying a computer. <laughs> so you might as well use the computer to do the work for you. And if it can help you autofocus better and help you get faster photos that are smarter, I mean, why, why would you turn that off? Right. So, well, and, and of course, Trey Trey has you know made a name for himself with uh, with making these gorgeous you know HDR uh, photography where you know it's just very technical taking a you know uh, high exposure low exposure image and combine them together. And I I gotta wonder like how much of what you're seeing now in cameras right now, Trey, is just a repeat of what we've already seen for still photography being done in video format instead. Like I every time I see like video. I, I get annoyed because like the background's blown out or the foreground or whatever. Like how soon until we have HDR video? Are you keeping tabs on that? Well, you know, <laughs> no one can do a grad filter like uh, Top Gear, right? Because, you know, when you're watching Top Gear and you're just going to get this heavy grad, they've got to actually put a, a physical um, uh, graduated filter on top of the lens to keep that sky from being blown out. But the sensors are getting really good now and you can do a lot of HDR stuff in camera. It can decrease the background of the, uh, these blown out areas. Uh, I know the new Epic red has HDR can shoot like 11 stops at once. Um, so, so, so that's, so I've seen, there. I've seen rigs that do HDR by having multiple cameras shooting the same scene. You have to use mirrors and then there's some sort of post-processing, but you're saying that this could be done in with one camera computationally or with a sensor that has a huge dynamic range, something like that? Well, let's keep in mind that HDR video is a totally different beast. It's not because the same not thing. everything looks good HDR, right? right? If you look at the way the, the human eye um, analyzes the world, okay, we actually use HDR on parts of the world where we actually care about the texture and the dynamic light. But there's other areas where we don't look at all the texture and light. For example, like when you look at somebody's skin, like if you look at Brian Brushwood's disheveled um, stig stigotomy there, hobo you can face. see that yeah. <laughs> you, know, you actually don't no look that closely at all the little physical flaws on people's faces because your eye just kind of glances over. You look at people's eyes and maybe a few other features, but you don't look at all the micro texture everywhere else. But like that chair you're sitting in, Leo, people are looking at the leather texture back there. They're looking at all the colors and the lights. They really look at this stuff. So, so you're, wait a minute, this is interesting. The brain you're is saying the flaws, to look at an HDR. the flaws in the overtan skin of my face, they overlook those because they're looking at my eyes or whatever, because that's how we're, we're biologically wired. But when they're looking at something inanimate, they'll, they'll see more flaws. Yeah, we really appreciate the textures wow. and the colors and the richness and the saturation in the world. But these software algorithms, they don't know that, right? They treat everything the same. So they will go over texturize human skin, for example. Or another good example, uh, like a big problem with HDR. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. I, I won't. But sometimes you see this, like a, a nice blue sky. And you'll see like a halo around the object and then blue sky. 
that's because people treat a blue sky just like human skin in that you just kind of like categorize it as like blue sky. But the algorithm will go in there and try to find all the little micro differences between the neighboring textures. What about something like Lytro? I mean, somebody in the chat room says, why is Lytro making these cube cameras? Why aren't they licensing this Ray technology to others? Like the idea of the Lytro camera was one image, multiple focal points in that image. Well, yeah, I hope a Sony or an Nikon buys that technology because the idea that that, that sensor can capture um, some 3D depth, right? They can get the angle of the light coming in and then they can extrapolate the, the 3D-ness or the Z depth of the image. That's pretty cool technology. Um, that little Lytro camera, I don't think it's really hitting it quite yet, but let's hope that someone big acquires them. It might be Nikon's only chance. I think, I think if Nikon and Canon don't get with it, that their camera divisions are going to like yeah. slowly dissolve over the next four or five years. And people that are doing interesting computational stuff like Sony and Samsung and others, they're gonna they're gonna rise to the top while these old school guys just just kind of fall apart under the weight of their own grandfathered system. Are they focused? Uh, do companies like Nikon or Nikon and uh, Canon focus on glass? Is that is that really? I mean, that's how they've made their name. Like the uh, Zeiss well, and is is great lenses, but a company like Samsung or Sony, I mean, yes, yeah, Sony owns. I guess Sony owns the Zeiss name, but. Uh, they could focus more on, they're more known for computational photography. Well, there's no doubt that those cameras have good glass and that might be kind of their last bastion. But remember that a lot of that big, heavy glass, like this one, for example. It's heavy. This is, uh, it's big. This is a, uh, a big DSLR wide angle lens. This is like 16 to 35. And so if you compare it to this little one, this is uh, 11 to 18. Wow. Well, they both go to a full-frame sensor right. uh, with no problem. The reason this one is so giant is because of the, just the distance that the optics have to travel. So great like it lenses, you know, like a, they're a great company. They make super tiny lenses, even smaller than this, which fact, fit fine on a 35 millimeter full-frame sensor. That, that A7R really, some have said, is really just a body for Leica lenses. You get the Leica converter and now you've got something. Ah, that's what I have. A, I have a whole review on this on my website. Yeah. And uh, I attached about four different Leica lenses to this, and they're super tiny and they're unbelievable. You know, the Leica lenses are a little bit expensive, but if you want to talk about quality glass, you don't have to get Nikon right. or Canon lenses. You, you can just go sacrifice. get some yeah. Leica lenses or Zeiss lenses. This, you can put any um, body uh, on any lens nowadays. So you can take whatever converter you want to. You know, this looks ridiculous, but you can take all your giant old Nikon lenses or Canon lenses and put it on this little body, but it's weird. You know, it's kind of like putting Robert Scoble's head on Chris Perillo's body. Uh, that would be weird. <laughs> that would be weird. Or, or hot if you read my slash fic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you don't expect, do you expect, what do you expect for uh, CES in this realm, Trey Ratcliffe? Well, I think we'll probably see some cool stuff from Samsung. No big announcements from the big guys, though. Right. Um, as far as the Sony camera goes, they've got their lineup of lenses uh, coming out over the next few uh, months and years. So that's that roadmap is done. I don't expect any surprises. Actually, I don't expect any surprises from people even outside of uh, the camera world. I, I would like to get some surprises like in the olden days. I don't days. know, but, but, but isn't that always the way with CES is nobody expects surprises. And then when CES is over... Everyone agrees that nobody was surprised. And then four months later, the big news is right. about that one thing that nobody really nobody no, found. Who noticed this at CES? Yeah. And yeah. now it's a big story. I mean, that's, I, I don't know. It's I feel like it's a, kind of a sucker's game to try to pick winners in, in, in that environment, full stop. This will be a CES of TVs. There'll be a lot more 4K TVs, even though there's no 4K content you can put on these TVs. The prices, it's interesting for 4K TVs, are very low. Uh, these yeah. ultra okay, so HD screens. I'll tell you what. I actually legitimately hate the talk about 4K programming. Keep in mind, when you go to the movie theater, oftentimes, even if they have a 4K projector, oftentimes they're only projecting in 2K, which means slightly better than 1080p. And this is the movie theater that you're going to. And in fact, it's like I can't stop trying to identify individual pixels whenever there's something that might slightly alias on there. However... I am huge, huge, huge bullish on 4K displays in the home, not for watching television, not for watching content, even though you have stories like Netflix is uh, promising their ultra super mega turbo EX HD or whatever. The reason I'm excited about it is because, and I've said this before, I am currently looking at five displays 
in front of me right now. And it's not because I just love multiple monitors. It's because there's so much content that I need to have in front of me in the studio. And there's not enough space on all of these monitors. I love the idea of 4K displays as giant video walls for doing your computing, for playing your video games, for creating content and just getting breathing room in, in your desk space. And in fact, there was one 4K display that was only like $500 over the holiday for like Black Friday or whatever. And I almost pulled the trigger on it until I heard about some minor ghosting issues and difficulty getting it um, uh, arranged just so. But like, am, am I the only one who hates the idea of 4K video for content, but loves the idea of 4K displays for a computer? I don't know. I mean, I've seen stuff in 4K and it's pretty dramatic. Last year or the year before, I think it was at NAB, uh, there was a 4K theater who was doing it? It might have been, uh, might have been a red. Unbelievable. I mean, and it's it not about pores and hairs. It's just about the feeling of reality that you're looking at. And well, thank goodness we're talking about 4K TV and not 3D TV. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Well, I so think tiresome. that's. I think that this is all market driven. That, that what we've seen, and in fact, it's why Sony and uh, Sharp and the Japanese manufacturers are really struggling, is because nobody's buying new HD TVs. They all, we've all got them. And so they came up with well, three D. They came the up with three D. Things trying. that might happen with four K TVs is people might put them on their walls and um, you know share their family photos on there. Kind of right. have this. I think this might be one of these background things that happen. We do it with Apple TV or Google TV or whatever. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's just nice to have family photos appearing in super high res up there all the time. I wish. Um, has Apple announced anything about making a 4K monitor? No, I'd love no. to buy one. Mm. So in fact, that's an interesting thing because of course Apple's Mac Pro is now shipping, although. For most people, I'm going to have one on Tuesday, by the way, thanks to Ed, one of our listeners who bought one and then said, hey, I don't really want it. He said, they already shipped it. You want it? And I said, yeah. So, we'll, <laughs> yeah. But Apple on its store is not, there is no 4K display. They talk a lot with the Mac Pro about 4K because the, you know, TV and movie industry needs a 4K workflow. And they need a machine fast enough to handle this super high resolution video. They're selling, I think, a sharp 4K display on the Apple site. No word whether Apple will do a 4K cinema display i think they want to i think they'd like to and you're right that's very different from a 4k television set and so i agree with you brian 4k you know that that 4k or more on the desktop would be awesome well and and keep in mind also it's like we're seeing in so many ways an exact repeat of what we saw and i guess this is what annoys me is we're seeing a repeat with diminishing returns everything that's happening right now on the content side of things is a repeat of what we saw with high definition uh house of cards was shot in 4k even though yeah. it was released at 1080p or whatever uh and uh, this is what we saw the next on the one late apparently season two is supposedly going to be 4k Right, right. Well, well, no. yeah, and, and of course they and and, and on, I believe the original the, was shot in 4K, right. but yeah, they'll they'll be releasing it as well. It's just sort of like this preventative thing where it's like there's a few shows where it's kind of embarrassing that that the shows started before HD, and you're <laughs> like, well, you should have shot in HD and then right. released in four by three or whatever. So it's like we're we're seeing that again, but again, it's not the content; it's it's just the display. I just it kills me that I'm looking at at five stupid monitors right now when one video wall would do the job just as well. Be patient. Have you guys seen any 4K content? Does it feel like because you know I see this a lot with super high def displays that even a very well shot thing just feels like a Mexican soap opera. Do you well, see it's, that? It's with, very realistic, yeah. And people complain yeah. about well, high frame rate. The same same thing about high frame rate. The Hobbit, which is shot down by you, I know you, you're posting pictures of Hobbiton from time to time, uh, was shot in 48 frames per second instead of the traditional cinematic 24 frames per second. And a lot of people complained. Last, at the last Hobbit, somebody, somebody said, it looks like Gandalf got his staff at Staffs R Us. And it's, it's made, you know, it's too, real, it's too real and you can see how plastic it is. I guess, and, and that's a good way to put it, Leo, is that it is too real. And and that's one of the weird things, like the, the high frame rate de debate. And I'm somebody who hates it. I, I you know, I bought a Samsung TV that interpolated and up Yeah, but the, that's fake you know, high the, frame the hertz. That's interpolation. Well, regar right, but regardless, it it, it just makes it, uh, Here here's where it works very well for sports because you do feel like you're seeing a window into another experience yeah. where yeah. everything is exactly the way you ex expect. It works very poorly in in dramatic uh situations because I remember I remember the first thing I did was put on uh, Cool Hand Luke and I'm like, is this three a-holes on a porch? What is this? <laughs> you can really <laughs> you can really see that it's not real. 
Yes, yes, no. exactly. I think that we're actually we're entering the uncanny valley of video. And Absolutely. until it gets a lot more How realistic, interesting. you know, like uh, the, the other kind of uncanny valley, we're just going to just reject it. Our human sense will reject this as not quite real enough where there's you're just in this hinterland where it doesn't feel right. That is really interesting. So you're, I think you're absolutely right. The, the uncanny valley is something they talk about in uh, in 3D graphics. You know, you watch Toy Story, and one of the reasons they make it of cartoon characters and toys is because if it's when it's real people, it looks kind of creepy because it's close enough that our bodies go, ooh, there's something wrong with that. And you're saying that as video quality get, or gets better and better and better, it, it right now we know it's fake. And we can live with that. But if it starts to look almost real but not quite real, that's more disturbing. Yeah. Suddenly we're buying all these TVs that make everything look like the Polar Express. <laughs> there was an Uncanny Valley movie. If yeah. there okay, so, so here's my question I want to put to you guys, if I could play it devil's advocate. Um, I'm going to suggest, and, I, and some other smarter people have written articles to this effect, that the backlash against 48 frames per second or, or high frame rate might not be so much an artifact of it being a bad idea so much as us as a society having been trained to, uh, in the gaps of 24 frames per second, project these larger-than-life images or whatever. But meanwhile, we've got this whole generation of kids who are coming in that don't have those preconceived notions. Kids, kids who are playing uh, to them, you know, you know, Call of Duty and these uh, these these high resolution video games that are running at you know 60 frames per second, 90, 120 frames per second. To them, the, there, there's no stigma that that as as Trey put it, you know, the Mexican soap opera opera stigma. It doesn't feel like anything associated with something bad. Could it be that five, ten years from now? It'll just be an old man thing that that we wish for the good old, you know, 15 frames per second hand cranked look. Bad news for me, like, it's already an old man thing. Get off of my lawn, you 4K. Expectations, right? No, I don't think you're right, Brian. I don't think it's it's like that at all. I don't think that it's we're too old because the human brain is incredibly plastic. You know, we're actually really good indications of that because we, we adopt all this new technology. We're early adopters. Our brain will bend around like, Remember, you know, 10 years ago, we used to have like one tab on our browser. Now we have 30 tabs and our brains can handle it. We're, we're super plastic in the way we think about things. But there is something that is inherently inhuman and unnatural about this uncanny valley of video. And there's some things that you never expect to work, but they actually do. I, I read this book by um, Walter Murch about editing. And he was one of the, you know, he's won all these Academy Awards for editing video and he was talking about the olden days of editing video. You know, in the beginning, they would just do one cut the entire time where the, there would just be one thing. And then they started making multiple angles. And they said when they first started editing photo, a video and showing different scenes, how it would jump outside, they would do a close-up of the face, and it would back up. They had no idea if audiences would actually understand that this is the same story. Is this one sort of contiguous story that's happening? Well, it turns out that the human brain did totally accept that. And now when we watch fast cuts and edits, the brain has no trouble understanding that. We're but getting used to it. When it comes to the video fidelity, messing with what we know of as a realistic interaction between humans or organic things, if it doesn't hit that realism, then our brain just rejects it. Well, you didn't, I take it you don't like 3D. Well, I, 3D doesn't work for me. Oh, but well, no, I don't like 3D, don't. and I think one of the complaints, and it's not it's not from Walter Murch, but another um, longtime film guy, maybe it was Walter Murch. Come to think of it, pointed out that the issue has to do with the very unreal focal length of you're looking at, at something at one distance and focusing in another distance. The brain is not so plastic that it can say, "Oh, yeah, that's fine." I mean, we are tuned to know how far away things are. And this dis well, and it's very disconcerting that you've you if you you only have one eye. Yeah. 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 I think we have we have pretty much the same. Problem. Yeah. I can. So, I only see yeah. one eye at a time myself. But and, you know, film and TV Wait, whoa, whoa, is, these whoa, are whoa, artistic whoa. Um, creations, Wait. and the cinematographer Wait. has framed things in a certain way to tell a story, put some things in focus, some things out of focus, because you're entering storytelling mode. You don't want to have this interactive thing where you are choosing what to focus on. You are just sitting there consuming information and you're just living in the story. You're living in someone else's story. And so you don't want to be like an active part of that because that, that just puts you in a totally different role. 
Interesting. I disagree. I feel, I think that there is a place for 3D. I think that cinematic 3D has come a long way. I think 3D and the television uh, at, at home was a ridiculous idea from an industry that was hungry just to have a new big thing to promote. And they, they made a bad bet by betting on technology that was already a decade old and it failed to go anywhere. And I think that we're seeing that finally they're like, okay, well, the one move we know that will work will be to up the resolution going to 4K. Having said all that, uh, there are a few, there's a reason that we go to movie theaters and that is to get a novel experience. And 3D can be part of a very delightful, very powerful novel experience. I think that uh, watching Avatar from James Cameron in 3D was a very good experience for me. I think it was the right way to shoot it. I think it was the right way don't to you, tell that don't, story. Don't you think that I you're think, more aware of the 3D that it takes you out of the movie a little bit? Uh, not not with, not for, uh, for example, gravity. Gravity. Uh, now, now, keep in mind, a lot of times, uh, I, I I'm glad I did not watch the Avengers in 3D because I got to see the story as, as it was meant to be. But something like gravity, where the very nature of the story is otherworldly, the very nature of the story is put yourself in a situation that is unlike the reality that you live in day to day. I think in that regard, having it in 3D was was a big enhancement. Now, having said all that, I will say that everything that we're seeing at home is terrible and I don't like any of it. And I hate 3D televisions. Uh, really? You know, at home. Really? Yeah, oh, no, no. I, th I think they've done a bad job. Well, because because the of, of the technology, it's either either they're, uh, number one, anything where you got to put crap on your face isn't going to work in the home. Uh, or most of them, we're using the, uh, you know, the, the what is it, the um, LCD flippy lenses where right. you're only seeing right. half the show at any Supposedly, given time. Like, I think all that was a bad idea. One of the things, Scott Wilkinson will cover this in our coverage of CES. One of the things that's there is true glasses-free 3D. And I'm, I'm poo-pooing it because I don't think it's actually possible. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, well, that would go a long way like to eliminating the pain point so for me, which is wearing these dumb glasses. It makes everything half as bright. It's just not as good. But and here's the Walter Murch. This is Walter Murch writing to uh, Roger Ebert uh, from a couple of years ago. Why 3D doesn't work and never will. Case closed. Uh, and just the sentence that I was. But in by the way, that's a good thesis. Those kind of statements always go over well and never get mocked <laughs> down in history. 3D films requires to focus at one distance and converge at the other. That's the screen distance versus the distance of whatever's on screen. After 600 million years of evolution has never presented this problem before, all living things with eyes have always focused and converged at the same point. And so 3D would, you know, it'll work. But it's I, like I, tapping I, like, your head and rubbing your stomach. It's difficult. No, Leo, like like whatever it is he says, no matter how right he is technically, I ju all I hear is like technical but complaints, you do like technical it. problems. But you like it. But it's like, well, no, no, I love it in principle. And in fact, I will say that gravity was better by seeing it in 3D. And Avatar was certainly better by yeah. seeing it all in right. 3D. Okay. So it can be done, but, but, but uh, again... You know, how we get there is is the question. You right. know, there's a lot of folks who, um, you know, they bother to record these movies using two cameras. And then they just throw out one camera because they decide it's better to digitally enhance it to get the feeling yes. of 3D after the fact. That's junky. Rather than actually use yeah. the actual information. That's junky. Another big uh, story we expect to see at CES is the car companies. It's uh, this, this started a few years ago when Alan Mulally keynoted CES. And Ford announced a bunch of uh, consumer electronics features in its cars. Now, Audi, Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, Mercedes, and Toyota will all be at CES. It's become, even though the Detroit Auto Show is roughly the same time, it's become an auto show. And, of course, what we'll see is a lot of telematics stuff. That's the computers uh, inside uh, the cars. Um, one of the keynote addresses uh, this year will be... Um, uh, I think GM's CEO, uh, chairman. Um, Audi is announcing that they are going to use Google Android to power their in-car computers now instead of QNX. Um, laser headlights in the Audi Sport Quattro. <laughs> Okay, what, okay, I'll bite. What is a laser <laughs> I don't know, but according to Audi... Blind passengers as you yeah, zoom past them. With freaking lasers. Leave all previous <laughs> systems in the dark with their high performance. We are showing the future of Audi here. Uh, Ford will show the CMEX solar energy. Now, this is a concept car, and that's important to say, but this will be a 
plug-in hybrid that can charge from the sun. And that so, would be amazing. Yes, absolutely. And and let me ask Dan this. Uh, you, you're back, right, Dan Patterson? Yeah, I think so. My apologies, guys. I think I ran out of my daily allotment of time on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> can I borrow a cup of internet, please? Three gigs a day. <laughs> so to me, there's only one story that I really care about, about cars and technology, and that's how soon will they start driving themselves? And to me, the big question is, like, there are people who are right now drafting early versions of legislation to handle uh, what happens when cars drive themselves. And understand, I, I am very pro cars driving themselves. I think it frees up the elderly. I think it cancels things like drunk driving and even, yeah. you know, kids, you know, who are 12 yeah. years old. Why not? You hop in a car or whatever. But my question to Dan <laughs> I is- I can't wait to that day. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Why not? Somebody, hop in the car, kid. Being... Hey, kid, go get me oh. a beer. <laughs> Actually, I didn't even thought about that. That's a good point, Leo. We should have that, too. Uh, how, how do you think this is all going to go down? Are we going to see it in stages where we see, like, yeah. drive assist stick around for 10 years? Or is it going to be, like, all at once, like, you just have cars that do all the driving? No, here's what's going to happen, I, I think. I bet yeah, you, I, think, I, I know how in, in the U.S., legislation, lawyers, they just ruin everything. They're going to have a lot of trouble getting it there. But I think that if Google comes and launches the self-driving cars here in New Zealand, you know, where they launched the, the loon balloons and like legislation is pretty easy here and they're just not so heavy handed. But the first country to get these kind of uh, uh, self-driving cars, it'll just make all the other countries so jealous that they'll just, like, you know how San Francisco got <laughs> yeah. Uber first, everyone wants it'll, Uber. So I think it's going to be a country thing. It'll be kind of similar. It, in a lot of ways, we can look at what's happening with Colorado and, and the marijuana uh, extensions that are occurring and, and apply that to technology like self-driving cars. On a federal level, I don't think there's a chance we're going to see this type of legislation anytime in the next, you know, bajillion years, unless it's tacked onto something. But on a state level, we will absolutely see places where there is a particular lobby. So where there is money, companies like Google, we will see them lobby on a uh, state by state level. And then after that, we'll see kind of an avalanche or a, a tidal wave of, of change. But I think on a federal level, we can kind of forget about anything happening, um, at, at least for the next nine months. And certainly after the midterms, we, we may see some legislation, but it's certainly not a high priority. Massachusetts in our chat room points out that this is something that the auto industry themselves may well lobby against because the ultimate goal of self-driving cars is to end personal own I think this may or may not be true, but to end personal ownership of vehicles. And certainly a lot of autonomous vehicle uh, proponents have talked about this. If you, The problem with everybody having a car is you only use it 10% of the time. If we had self-driving cars, they could come to you, you could drive it, leave it wherever you left it, and you wouldn't need to own a car. It's kind of the ultimate Uber. I mean, that that makes sense in theory, except for the fact that you're talking about, like, these are the guys who are going to provide the new version of cars that everyone on planet Earth needs to buy. I mean, that's uh, I, I, that's where I disagree with That's a good point. This. That's a good Is, point. They're going to make money at uh, first. <laughs> yeah. and, and, yeah, it may be, well, and It may be very, very iterative, right? It may be steps like we've seen at Ford. I think what we've seen with Malawi at Ford in the last like five years has been very exciting. Yeah. But I think incrementally we will get there. Little oh, I'm change sure we by will. little change. I'm sure right? we'll. Heath, Alan always said, no, we're not doing autonomous vehicles. And then I, I kept saying, come on, Alan, in the back room. No, we believe people want to drive. And then, of course, yes, in the back room, Ford has autonomous vehicles, just like every other manufacturer in the world, I'm sure. Well, and I'll tell you what, I mean, think about how much better everything becomes uh, from, from, first of all, the vast, we're talking orders of magnitude of, of lives being saved because of our stupid, you know, fl dumb flesh handling stuff poorly. And meanwhile, freeing us up to do stuff that we truly love. Like yes. we apparently really like to send text messages while we drive. Guess what? You can send all you the can. text messages you want you in the future. You can be as drunk as you want. I, for one, support a drunk text messaging future in which the cars are taking care of us. Right on, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Right on, my friend. We're, <laughs> we're talking about the week's tech news and what to look forward to uh, from CES. I'm sure there'll be a lot of tech news emerging. Most of it kind of junky, but maybe there'll be something of interest. We'll talk more in a bit. Dan Patterson is here from Tanuki Labs, a good friend of the uh, show and a, and, a, and a journalist who is reinventing what journalism means in the digital era. Brian Brushwood, magician extraordinaire. 
host of uh, NSFW. And I got to give a plug to the new show, The Cord Killers. You're doing something interesting. You're doing this, uh, you and Tom Merritt are doing this as a crowdfunded show. And you've raised a lot of money. Did he suddenly get quiet? He just got back. Oh, he took Who? off? You didn't know I was going to talk off. to him. <laughs> no. I. Uh, you know what happened was, is I, I opened the window because it was lovely and cool outside, and then it became nighttime and cold as hell. So I went and just fixed it. What, what did I miss? Oh, just giving you a plug. No big deal. We're moving on yeah. right now. Uh, Good. No, I was talking about guy. Patreon and uh, the way that you guys, Tom, and you are raising money to do the show, which I think is very innovative. Do, do you know that Patreon was created by the folks who do um, uh, Pomplamoose? Have you ever seen Pomplamoose? The band? They're, yeah, the I band. love the them. Band. Yeah, Jack Conti is the uh, the guy who, um, you know, I, I guess there's there's a generation of people who are making videos on YouTube, and they're realizing that the YouTube revenue's not that great. Yeah. And so yeah. they're realizing that to put the time and effort to do, uh, in, 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 in so many ways, it's like this market equality thing, which I love. Because somewhere out there is somebody who wishes there was a way for them to throw more money in your face. Uh, and and Patreon is basically a way for you to uh, decide your own level of involvement on anything. I think um, uh, they first reached out to us uh, a, a while ago. But I, I think what they're doing is really interesting. And I think people are, uh, in many ways, it's this whole destabilization of of the old media way you don't I agree. need a mediator it's decentralized if wants to give you money they, yeah. yeah exactly and uh you know I, I mean really that's what kickstarter was supposed to be it ended up being kind of a more of a product marketplace than us than kind of a creative support so this is and this is a little different because you're subscribing to a show here you're not merely right. donating so in the case of cord killers when you when you don't just give them money you say i'm going to give a certain amount per episode yeah, there's a little bit of a hiccup there because uh, a lot of people, you look at them, for example, my friends have, over at Rage Select, uh, they do video game playthroughs. And I think video game playthroughs are going to benefit a lot from a service like Patreon because uh, especially, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard well, about YouTube this. Well, YouTube is hostile to those for one thing. Correct, correct. Well, and specifically, like uh, what Nintendo will do is when somebody plays a Nintendo game and does a playthrough and monetizes it, Nintendo will go in and just take the money. Right. They'll just say, yes, leave it online, send that check to us because we own everything that's on that. And of course, video games are this weird synergistic place where it's like, uh, and, I, and I guess as you've experienced with the news as well, it's not just the content, it's also the comment and, what, and the character that gets put into it. Um, and so in the case of Rage Select, you know, uh, they put out like maybe 20 videos a week. And so people will pledge, uh, we'll say $5 per video or whatever. But you can set, since you can set a monthly limit to it, people are like, whoa, you guys are banking. You're doing $800 a video. And then they're like, yeah, we get maybe 200 of that because everyone hits their limit, uh, their uh, monthly limit in like the first two weeks or whatever. So that's but, so but it's, it's, still, it's not transparent. So when I go to Rage Select, I'm seeing that they have 257 patrons, which in theory, is $1,000 per video, but in Correct. fact, it could be considerably less. Right. They, okay. they from, what, from what I've been told and what, what they've said on the stream is that it ends up being closer to like $200, $250 an episode, which, again, is enough to keep the lights on, and they're, of course, right. very thankful for it. But I wish there was a way that there was more transparency on Patreon for that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's but, an innovative uh, and interesting way of, uh, of doing something, and I think it's great. And the nice thing is, uh, unlike what we do where you... Really, a thousand people would not be enough to make a show sustainable, at least not financially. Um, even though it's a good size audience, uh, it is, on Patreon it would it could be could be completely viable. Well, and, and I guess it, that's it's that market efficiency, right? right. It's like um, what you it adds another vector because in the old old medium of television, only one thing matters: how many eye, eyeballs. And it didn't matter how much or how little they loved the show. What matters is did they tune in on Tuesday at seven p.m. Right. And nowadays, we're getting to a place where you can you can care enough to you know to uh, use a sponsor or even care enough to you know throw money in someone's face directly in whatever amount you want. I so think that's I, one I, of the secrets to our success with advertising is that our audience does realize that supporting a sponsor supports us, so our ads do better. Uh, Absolutely. Than than on other uh, things. Anyway, at Patreon. If you want to know more, patreoncom slash Uh Brian and Tom's new show, and you're doing so far. You're doing great. Almost a thousand patrons. That's awesome. It's 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 of hey, course Brian, easy have to have that when you ever sale on YouTube. 
Uh, you, you know, I haven't tried selling anything on YouTube. And you would think that, um, you know, Scam School, of course, we do free magic tutorials. Uh, and uh, you you would think that would be a perfect marketplace. But instead, I've I've created some higher end, more complicated tutorials, but we've sold them all through uh, Shopify instead. Uh, with and it's all DRM free, but but I I I mean, have you? What about you? You do tutorials as well? Yeah, we well we sell tutorials through the main website, Stuck in Customs Direct, just like you, DRM free. But we also have experimented on YouTube because you know you can make them rental, but we make our rentals uh, forever, and it works ah. great because you know it's kind of like Apple. Once you're in Google Wallet and they got your credit card information, it's easy for people to just to you know buy more stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty convenient model rather than sending people to a thousand different stores over the internet. Um, you know, everyone's on YouTube. I just feel uh, like YouTube's uh, so hostile to some kinds of, your content's perfect for YouTube, but our content, they're very hostile to it because of content well, ID. What we saw with Rap Genius is that if you are so dependent on one mechanism of driving traffic, then you are also susceptible to that deciding that uh, we no longer like your tax of customer acquisition and the same thing on YouTube, right? All of the, unfortunately, some of the great gamers or game streamers that we love to watch uh, over the last, you know, six weeks have, have had their uh, YouTube lives kind of rearranged by a seemingly arbitrary change in policy. So, you know, yeah, I mean, we all live, is great. So Rap Genius, which is a really uh, great idea. It's a site uh, for uh, rap uh, lyrics, right? Um but kind of, it's kind of fun. They got banned by Google for what Google considered SEO inappropriate SEO tactics. But we're all vulnerable to that, right? Google wields yeah, huge right. amount of power. Anybody who's on the web, if Google bans you, if Google removes you or deranks you, you're dead. Uh, fortunately, Rap Genius um, said, "Oh, we're sorry." They said what they did wrong, and they've been brought back after uh, ten days. Uh, but this was right. This is, I mean, this could be the end it's, of the world for them. It's it's so it it's could, sort of a two way thing street. Could happen anywhere, right? Yeah. Well, and 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 th there's a bit of a chess game happening at any given time. And it used to be that the chess game of power uh, was those people who are in control and then could shape the message after the fact. But nowadays, we live in such a a free zone of communication where it, you would think if this happened 20 years ago, the story is. Google busted them. These guys are out. And then Google just says whatever they want about them. But we live in a world where Rap Genius continues to have a microphone and continues after the fact to say, yeah, we probably abused the policy, but here's why it was designed. Uh, the, the, the system is designed that this is the way you win. So we tried to do that and we and, and it worked well until now you're throwing us out. And so now it puts Google in the awkward position of like, okay, well, are we the empire who is like, no, you're done. You crossed us and we're going to uh, screw you out forever. And now all of a sudden there's a value to Google to be gregarious and bring them back in. I, I, I think it's fascinating and I think good for everyone in the long term that we live in a world where everyone has a voice. There's at least a whether discussion. Whether it's popular or not. Yeah, yeah. although... Yeah, the same thing with the gamers on YouTube, right? They're... they're And, and that's driving uh, uh, discussion and, and traffic towards alternate forms of distribution as well. Uh, you know, we can see the rise in Twitch in the last couple of weeks and the same... The change in these policies, right? We're going to yeah, take... Twitch is going crazy. I was just looking at twitch.tv and right now there's over 50,000 people... Uh, watching Phantom Lord uh, play live. And, you know, you can subscribe for $5 to these individuals. You know, we missed the boat because you kind of, Brian Brushwood, invented this, and I did a little bit of it too. You used to do, I remember when uh, Lords of the Old Republic, was it, or Gil, uh, came out, you Knights played it. Knights of the it, Old Republic. Knights of the Old oh, Republic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You played yeah, it Knights online. Knights of the Old Republic. Yep. And your commentary. And when we did, I did that with Skyrim, and it was huge. And I just should have realized, oh, people want this. We well, but, but it's also it's it's also an emerging shape, right? Because on the one right. hand, um, uh, yes, the most interesting media development in the last ten years to me has been the fact that it turns out people love to watch other people play games. But now we're seeing the entanglements that come with it because if you want to monetize the fact that you're playing this game or whatever, we're seeing this backlash where it's like, well, I own this, or actually that song was licensed, but not for this use, and so on. So, I mean, it's going to be ugly, which, which again, to go back to the Patreon thing, what's great is about that direct support sort of subverts it. So you're not monetizing it, but instead uh, just sort of directly 
hey, man, I'm going to hang out and play this game. If you think I'm awesome, throw me $5. Phantom Lord is, uh, has a subscription as well, and there's pre-roll ads. I mean, there's definitely monetization going on in this, but 50,000 people watching. Wow, that's two pre-roll ads now. I skipped one, and I've got the <laughs> second one. Let's see if there's a third. Yes, there is. Three ads that I've had to skip through. Am I going to have to watch one to the very well, end? And, and, and again, this is, I, I, I actually suspect that this is the, pro oh, gastric bypass surgery. Thank yeah. you. Um, the, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is this is an unfortunate place that live playthroughs are <laughs> dealing with right now. And I think that is part of the reason you're going to start to see more direct subscriptions. Hold on. What are you looking at? I'm go back, skipping. Go back to <laughs> it showed three seconds of Phantom Lord and then it went back to the ads. I guess yeah, I have to get. Hey, I guess you got to get gastric <laughs> bypass surgery, or you can't watch Phantom Lord. <laughs> Maybe he thinks I'm too fat to watch. Huh? Jeez. You know, I, I, I actually suspect that that this is sort of an indication of uh, some version of this idealized gift economy. You know, where it's like, uh, look, just don't show me ads. Give me on some service where I can watch you directly, and I'll throw money in your face. Uh, because people love the content providers enough that they don't feel bad about doing that. I mean, it, you've seen that firsthand, right, Leo? Oh, yeah. Although it was never enough money to make Twit be as big as it's become. Uh, or or people, free, sure. Yeah, people are very generous, and we've raised, you know, I don't know what, but a lot of money through donations and bricks and so forth. But ultimately, it's a fraction of what we need to build the network. We had to do uh, advertising. I, you know, oh. it, it, what is great is to see a thousand models bloom. And there there's some models that are appropriate. I feel like ultimately giving ad-supported media is very democratic. Everybody gets it. And I don't have to worry about holding back. I don't have to say, well, you're, if you're not a subscriber, you can't see the special content, whatever. I, I want to get as many places as possible. And uh, and everybody wins. And so that's what I like. It's where I came from. Uh, but every there is, it's great that there's so many models for this. Well, I'm still watching right. guy, gastric bypass surgery. I just, <laughs> I just, I, I guess I'm never going to see this. People will die, Leo. Hey, of gastric let's say bypass. one thing about gastric bypass surgery ads, and that it is at least disclosed and upfront. It may be disgusting <laughs> to look at, but it's not. It's not native advertising, right? No, it's, that's true. If you were watching, I mean, if is, you were watching a game, and all of a sudden he had gastric bypass surgery in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Product placement. That I don't like. Vertical integration. All right, let me do an ad since we're, and, and this is very clearly, if you see it on blue paper, it's an ad. Okay, we're going to yeah. continue on with Brian Brushwood, Dan Patterson, and the great Trey Ratcliffe. By the way, here is the graph of the drop in views on wow, Rap dramatic. Genius from 700,000 uniques a day to 100,000 from delisting by Google. That's the heavy band hammer Google wields. And what was, what was, uh, I'm sorry to hold us Internal back, but like, what was the specific in in infraction? It was complicated. Internal linking for the most part, the same tactic that a lot of uh, uh, publishers use, right? So if I am, say, Mashable, who I love, I'm just, I'm not picking on them, I'm just using it as an example. But if Mashable will say, uh, let's say we're writing a, an article about uh, the latest in wearable monkey technology, and they have a ton of posts about wearable monkey technology. So instead of linking to wearablemonkeytechnology.com, they link internally to mashable.com slash tag slash monkey technology. So it's... It, it, inter it I includes hate that. using the anchor text, the H1 tags and the anchor text, the loaded keywords in the front, the first paragraph or two of the post, they will push you further in and create, Google will see those links attached to the anchor text, attached to high density keywords and say, oh, this is a relevant result. And you link to yourself. So you drive more internal traffic uh. and use yourself for Google juice, right? So they actually used a tactic that is very, like you'll see this tactic everywhere. They just were very clever about it and turned the lyrics of rap songs into URLs, which meant that people searching for not rap genius, not even Tupac, but the actual lyric in the song will find not just the, the song itself but the explicit lyric that they used and that will drive them deeper into the site as opposed to bouncing off the site so it lows, lowers your bounce rate as well sorry man. i know you keep trying to do the ad and uh, you no, know. This no, no, is no, good no, stuff. But, but that's 
that, that's, that, that, that's an doing. interesting thing because on the one hand, like um, on the one hand, that's the that's the house that Google built is to favor yep. that kind of response. Exactly. And then, uh, but on the flip side, it's Google's house, so they have the freedom to say like, right. "Screw you, we don't like what you're doing." Right. So you know, we'll know. get Matt Cuts because he's the guy who's in charge of yeah. all this. In fact, the guy who busted Rap Genius, we'll get him on uh, this week in Google soon. He's a regular on the show and ask him uh, what happened. They were busted by a blogger who was invited by Rap Genius to trade uh, social media links for. Uh, Blog posts uh -huh. or something. So there was, you know, there was a lot of little stuff going. Hey, they're Yale guys. They they know how to play the game. These Yale guys, you got to watch out for them. They're a shifty <laughs> lot, a shifty lot. Our show today brought to you by our good old friends, Fresh Books. Are you using Word or Excel to create invoices? I used to do that. Have a shoebox or receipt to keep track of your expenses. Well, now you can save time and get paid faster with FreshBooks.com. The easiest way to send invoices. Manage expenses and track your time. They're also really great guys. It was Amber MacArthur who introduced me to FreshBooks when I was working in Toronto. I had to bill companies in the U.S. and Canada. I would always put off invoicing. It was so embarrassing. You know, six months later, you send an invoice. They go, what's this? The, the, you can't wait that long to invoice this. FreshBooks was a boon for me, a cloud accounting solution that's simple, easy to use, and has helped thousands of new entrepreneurs and small business owners save time with billing and really get paid faster you can easily create invoices online capture and track expenses on the go and get real-time business reports with a few simple clicks it's gotten much more sophisticated since i used it free for 30 days when you go to getfreshbooks.com and yes they're bringing back the birthday cake <laughs> every day they're giving away a birthday cake to someone who signs up to a, for a new account from a twit so for your chance to win when they uh, say how did you hear about us you enter this week in tech at getfreshbooks.com, and you're in the running. <laughs> for, and they're very nice birthday cakes, I might add. With FreshBooks, every day could be your birthday. Try it free for 30 days. Getfreshbooks.com. They were a lifesaver for me. I highly encourage it. If you're doing your own invoicing, uh, you're doing it. I was doing it in Word. Oh, that was a nightmare. Ooh. Freshbooks.com. Hey, I want to show you a video. Let's do the, uh, the promo because I want to show you a video of what happened. We talked about New Year's Eve. We've cut it down 23 hours into 60 hot seconds of fun. If you missed our New Year's Eve promo watch, or our New Year's Eve Previously show. on Twit. <laughs> Matt Break Weekly. Both buttons have popped off now. Brand new yes, tuxedo. Yes, 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 listeners, that's how excited that the new <laughs> Mac Pro makes Leo. Oh! NSFW. But Wait. what this shows is the American public is unclear about whether people are dead <laughs> <laughs> and feel the need to search for like, them. I'd be like, this is a startup opportunity. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Have a great 2014. We'll okay. see you back here on Thursday. Bye bye, everybody. Twit, wishing you a happy new year. <laughs> Take that, Dick Clark. There's Steve Gibson dancing with a cardboard cutout of Captain Kirk. You'll not see that. On network television anywhere. <laughs> Man, I think I think meeting Steve one a bit might have been one of my favorite moments of the entire He's, night. Like just getting to hang out with him and experience him one on one. I what I think we realized that the real fun of this, and by the way, we still have plenty of Cook's champagne left. <laughs> These six dollar <laughs> magnums really go a long way. I just want to point out. Should I open another one? Oh my god. What I just want to, what, what we realize the real Gotta value be New Year's somewhere, Leo. <laughs> go ahead. What I realized is in here. I'll hold my glass over here. We originally did it because we're international and we realized that it was New Year's for 24 hours all over the world. And we did. We talked to people all over the world. I mean, it was really uh, amazing. The Skype calls to Samoa and to New, New Zealand and Australia. And uh, we talked to India. We talked to Bahrain. Uh, it was so cool. But what we also realized the value was seeing our hosts outside of their normal contexts. To get to see Steve Gibson playing, what was he, the navigation officer. On the Starship sure. Enterprise. It was great. It was fun. But, and even getting him in person, you know, yeah. to show up uh, during one of our, on our NSFW Pro XPN ad. Oh, wasn't that funny? To. Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted to do that. That's from uh, Annie Hall where uh, Woody Allen is standing in line behind some pompous ass talking about Marshall McLuhan's theories. And, he, and Woody says, 
you know nothing about Marshall McLuhan. He says, in fact, I have him right here. And he pulls over Marshall McLuhan <laughs> and says, Marshall McLuhan says, yes, you are a fool. And that's, I always wanted to do that. So we, that's what we did with Steve Gibbs. <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of fun. We are going to do it again next year. We've already decided. So, Brian, you're booked for New Year's Eve for the rest of your life. Do you do? I'll can just you, write a new magic show. Can you do uh, acts? Uh, is is there a demand for you on New Year's Eve? You know, uh, yeah, uh, holiday t and tends to be a big time for corporate shows. You know, most of my live stage shows tend to be at uh, colleges, which right. is homecoming and uh, new student orientations over the summer and stuff. Right. Uh, but uh, it's one of the, it's hit or miss on on New Year's Eve. But I was, you know, I was glad you guys stole me this year. Thank Yay. you. Well, and just to pe people are worried, this didn't go to waste. We gave it to homeless shelters. Uh, so 30 or 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's no. good. There's a pressing need for booze at homeless shelters. More <laughs> champagne in the homeless shelters. Um, schedule. Oh, we are changing our schedule. This is the first week coming up of our brand new schedule. I wanted to get Thursday and Friday off two days in a row. What a concept. Steve Gibson cracked me up. He said, what are you going to do with two days off in a, in a row? I said, Steve, that's called a weekend. It's normal. Steve, like many of us, works, and I'm sure this is true of you, Brian, every single day. I'm sure Dan as well. I'm sure yeah. yeah the, right. the, the, by the way, the, the answer to that question, what do you do with two days off? Anything you Work. want. Yes, it's called a weekend. So we are moving shows around. You can go to our Inside Twit blog running on Squarespace, inside.twit.tv. Uh, I won't be here Monday because I'm going to New Media Expo tomorrow, but we'll be back. Uh, but Sarah's going to do iPad today with a special guest host, you, Chad Johnson. That's yep. great. Uh, I don't think we're going to do a triangulation. Twit Wyatt will, of course, continue. Then it's uh, on Tuesday. Ma Tech News Today, of course, at 10 a.m. Monday through Friday. Now I'm trying to read it, and I can't. Let's see. Mac Break Weekly and Security Now on Tuesday, Before followed by Before You Buy. Wednesday, Floss Weekly, Tech News Today, Windows Weekly, this week in Google, i5 for the iPhone and the Gizwiz, Ham Nation following that uh, Thursday. Anyway, it's all there, the social hour. So we're moving a few shows around so that I can uh, have a couple of days off in a row. And that does start this week. So if you're wondering where your favorite show went, if you watch live, you know, we found out in our survey, one of the really interesting things is that more than half of you at some point watch live. Right on. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I'd like yeah, we've been meaning to talk to you. We're going to need all of you to watch live all the time. That's all right? the new future. I don't think it's much to ask. <laughs> just 24 hours a day. Well, that's all we week. ask. Just leave it on somewhere in your house. That's all we ask. Hey, uh, we, we started a new era of tech news today with Mike Elgin uh, hosting, and uh, Mike has a look at the week ahead. Mike? Thanks, Leo. Coming up in the week ahead, CES will dominate the tech news, of course, starting right now. The CES Unveiled event started at 4 p.m. today, and that's where about 70 companies are giving the media a sneak peek at the products they'll unveil at CES. Tomorrow is press day, which is packed with press conferences and announcements galore. And then Tuesday, of course, the show starts. So it's going to be all CES all the time next week. Back to you, Leo. So the week ahead, mostly CES coverage, and I want to, I'm want i very excited. This week in Enterprise Tech, uh, Robert Balasser, uh will be down there. Father Robert will be covering CES uh, Scott Wilkinson will be doing his traditional home theater geeks there, talking to all the TV manufacturers about UHD, 4K, and OLED, of course. And uh, the Gizwiz will be there to find his usual weird stuff. In fact, it all begins, I think, tonight. Robert's going to the uh, CES Unveiled event tonight. Is this the year we see an iWatch? It seems like, I, I don't think we'll see this at CES, but it seems like wearables are, are going to be the product of the year 2014. Or is that nuts? What do you, Trey, uh, Trey you wear, you wear uh, Google Glass all the time, don't you? I do. I, I have it right here. In fact, it's uh, out of charge. I've been wearing and recording so many videos. But I don't know about a watch. Um, because the kind of I'm pro wear, watch. I'm team watch. You're team <laughs> yeah. Borg. Glasses. You know what I am? <laughs> I'm, team. I'm team heads up display. The problem with Google Glass is you have to look up to this little screen. I don't want to look. I want to see a heads up like a like from Demon, a heads up display that that's augmented reality. I want to know what's going on in the world without looking away from the world. I think Robert's right about that this this year. I mean, glass. I've been sitting on an Explorer invite for for ages and just can't bring. It's too much to, money. Fifteen hundred bucks. It's, Come on. it's too much money, but it's. All, I mean, Robert's right. This is coming. This is inevitable. Uh, those of us uh, who when are. When you say Robert, you mean or, Scoble? Scoble, Scoble, yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, with his his post last week, uh, uh, and that and was like uh, the, the worst link made ever. The post's headline was oh, "Glass sure is was. Doomed," 
In which he, of course, said, no, it's not. <laughs> right. <laughs> this year, this year, glass will be a peripheral product. But I, I think, I mean, whether we see something from Apple or not, uh, who knows? But wearables are coming. Uh, and, and I think that was portended by Siri and Google Now a couple years ago. Whether it's this year or not, who knows? Robert is right in that glass is too clunky right now. But, of course, it's prototypical and we will see. Right. It's not that the wearable technology is coming soon. It is that a desire for personal data and useful personal data is coming. So the Fitbit pretends this. Right. Uh, and and it, in fact, not to plug my old employers, but some all in companies like Gecko Board who are on the train with, let's track, analyze. It's the, the you know, quantified self movement. That, if not, if not coming, is already here. So you Basis, say it'll be health, example, right? you think it'll be health focused? I think it'll be data focused. I think gaming is another, I mean, that somebody hasn't hasn't dug deep into the Steam and Blizzard uh, uh, Battle.net APIs is shocking to me. I think that personal data and access to personal data is what's coming. Be very interesting to play a game. Is that what you're talking about? Kind of an augmented reality game? No. Not, no, not necessarily playing a game, but tracking your data, collecting your data into one place and having access to it in a way that's useful. So, for example, I, you know, I live in New York, but this could be just as easy in South Dakota. I have a Fitbit, right? That alone. Own. That is simply technology that sits on me and it tracks and quantifies my steps per day, right? You use that every day. All of a sudden, I can bend my data curve in a positive direction. I can bend with access to and knowledge of my, my own personal data. I can then influence the course of that data. So we can apply that same metaphor to gaming and say, well, with access to basic like time spent played or achievements or progression in any capacity allows me to bend my data curve in gaming or almost any, you know, personal driving cars. The access to data and ability to manipulate it is what's coming. Wearables simply allow us to, to gather that data. Well, Dan, you know, you know what's really cool about this is they just released a new app like last week. It's called Strava Run. So now whenever I go on a run, I put this on. Yeah, and it has GPS data. It has my speed. So, it has altitude. It has everything, right. and it and uploads you can take it immediately when I get back. And so I just look at a map and I see my little run around Lake Hayes, and I yeah. see where I was going fast and slow. And so now I can't bear to go on a run without turning this on because I feel like I'm not, you know, I've kind of personally exactly. gamified it. And Strava is incredible, yep. and it works just flawlessly. And it's really cool to be like running and and look at how fast you're going, and look at your lap speed, and yeah. it's pretty awesome. <laughs> right. You could go neighborhoods explored or, uh, you know, paths. I used to live in the mountains. I live in a big city and you could do it anywhere, right? Just saying like, this is what I, these are the benchmarks that I've accomplished and these are my goals. And now I have the data that allows me to not just guesstimate it, but know it precisely. And just like you said, Trey, see it in a way that really resonates with my emotions by looking at a map. I mean, that's so much more interesting than, you know, a spreadsheet. That's too much exercise. But would it, is it possible to have an app that watches what you're watching on TV and lets you know how much you watched uh, TV? Or maybe I'm how sure. much you ate while you were watching TV? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. And to be honest, like the, the eating thing, I would love to. Here's yeah, the thing is right. we exist. We exist as more than our physical bodies. And we even exist more than what we're doing at any time. We exist as our footprint on the social strata around us. We exist as... Um, uh, both outputs and inputs of of what people you know. Whenever there's a sale that happens on my online store uh, at Scam Stuff, uh, you know my Pebble vibrates, and I and I glance down, and it's like it, it's good input to know that okay, my not only my physical health, you know, we're good at monitoring our physical presence at any given time, but you know your your financial health, you want to keep track of, you want to keep track your of the, the physical momentum, whether you're getting in your mental health, whether or not you're getting enough of X, Y, or Z. You want to know if if somebody is is reaching out to you or if you just got a yeah. message and uh, wearable tech is not just the future, it's inevitable. The version yep. that we're seeing of it right now, I think that uh, that Google is right in that an ever-present visual element will be part of the future. Unfortunately, they've done it in a very ostentatious way that makes a statement that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. Uh, on the flip side, you know, Pebble has understated it. You know, Pebble is in many ways the um, the Palm Pilot, where they took the the same idea as, as the Newton, but made it in a way that was palatable and 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 would hint at what would you would see eventually with smartphones in general. So uh, I, I think that we're going to see it on the wrist first, but I think we're going to eventually start seeing uh, interesting stuff. Like imagine a, an anklet that you keep on you 
that does nothing but communicate to you vital information through series of taps or vibrations, uh, something that that gives you an important thing. Oh, my wife just got home. I know because it was three short, one long or whatever. Once you speak that language, eventually what we regard as ourselves will expand to a larger presence and yeah. it will be expected, you know, that that you you summon your car by tapping your heels together while casually talking to someone. And then yeah. your ankle vibrates because the car is now within a block and you say your goodbyes and walk out the door. Uh, to, to me... That is all, that's all great. It's obviously going to come. It's obviously definitely going to happen. And to me, it's very human, as as inhumane as, as, as it sounds. Yeah. yeah. It, it allows, per, uh, uh, wearable technology allows for persistent data gathering. And that persistent ga data gathering, just like Brian was saying, you know, a basis watch can tell me whether my heart rate was up on days that the weather was good during the morning and that I sweat more in the evening, right? Putting that into a graph and a chart allows me to really understand what makes me happy or when am I happy. So this this persistent data is really that that uh, uh, wearable technology allows for a, a post-corporal future, right? So putting things on us allow us to, just like Brian said, extend ourselves beyond just the idea of me as an individual, but me as as a data footprint that is is constantly in motion and changing. And now for the first time ever with wearables, I'm able to analyze those changes. I can, I can bring in and understand a lot of the things that have so far been abstract. Do you think with the revelations this year about the NSA, that slows this kind of thing down? Because don't we now fear data collection because we fear that the government might get it? Not as it's much tough as we because, desire cool gadgets. Yeah, and and that's the thing is is we we haven't felt the sting of what it means to have somebody scooping up all of our data full stop. So far, uh, the only uh, like when I personally think of like what data is being scooped up on me, I think about like my Lose It app where I gladly tell it every beer I drink, every chocolate I wolf down or whatever, and in exchange I get an accurate picture of my life. Uh, we haven't seen the negative side of that yet. And who knows, maybe there is no negative side. Maybe in a hundred years, we'll realize that the best thing you could do is have everyone know everything about you. But my guess is that there will be some very loud, very ostentatious stories of horrific things that have happened because of the, the hoovering right. of data. And I think that's what it's going to take to put a stop to the NSA. But I do believe that there will be um, the perception. The problem is, is, is we all embrace the perception of these brief moments of total privacy of our inner self. And even if they're false, we we like that feeling. The problem is uh, that that now th there there will be a dollar motive for people to buy the the a plausible version of privacy from time to time. And we have this this really interesting moment where we have to uh, humans are forced with the cost benefit analysis to really make a, a zero sum type of decision based on, okay, yes, I know my data is being gathered, but that is an abstract negative weighted against the very practical positive of having a smartphone or, or a cool wearable in the future, right? You can't really exist in the now without some sort of access to the web and, and interaction with the web. That is a very tangible positive. And when you weight that against an abstract negative, like they, capital T, they might be watching, most people who do that cost benefit go, I, and just give me a phone. Yeah, I just want the stuff. I just want it to work. Right. Trey, you're doing something interesting with Glass. Do you want to talk about your mentoring um, project? Yeah. Um, Unless it's not public. Yeah, we, Do you, am I, am I, he says, we just launched this. Actually, you know, you know Lisa Bettany and, yep. and all these people. We, so we just launched this thing. It's called the Arcanum. The Arcanum.com, named after Patrick Rothfuss is the name of the wind, Arcanum. Sort of an homage to him. And basically what we're doing is bringing back the master and apprentice way of learning because I think this is something that's gotten lost over time, unfortunately. And, you know, the, the Internet's uh, solution to education has been basically just to dump a ton of videos online. And if you want to learn something like Photoshop, you, you log in and, and uh, you pay, you know, 20 or 30 or $40 a month and you have access to uh, thousands and thousands of videos. But actually, that's not how most people learn. 
uh, most people learn through a, a master and apprentice type situation. And a lot of our masters right now have uh, Google Glass. And the idea that you can communicate real time to your little group of apprentices and they can ask you questions like in a Google Hangout. Uh, we're kind of all built on top of Google technologies. But it's a really cool thing. So it's like an augmented reality Hogwarts where you're <laughs> constantly connected to your master and your fellow apprentices. And it's a super fun way to, to learn. You've got some of uh, my favorite photographers working on this. Is it just photography? What else are you going to cover? Well, you know, we're, we're starting focused with just photography and visual arts. We mm -hmm. do have a hand-drawn art category. That'd be too, cool to watch but... somebody uh, as an as a artist and, and to learn how they do what they do via glass. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, anything that can be taught visually where you get to see your hands or you get to log in live and see what someone else is seeing. Uh, that's incredibly valuable because the, uh, uh, the idea that you can connect with a fellow human and have this very human interaction with learning and you can ask questions in an interactive way and also learn while all your fellow apprentices are learning. Um, I think this is one of the key aspects to learning that's, that's kind of fallen by the wayside with the Internet. So we're... We're bringing it back just through modern technology. We haven't invented anything at all. We, we're just synthesizing things that are already out there. Well, or, or virtualizing that which already works. Uh, all of the best development on the Internet uh, tend to be stuff that's just a virtualized version of something that already was established. You know, Facebook is a virtualized version of, you know, the relationship with your families, you know, that you no longer happen to live near. You know, Twitter is the virtualized version of small talk and the Arcanum is a virtualized version of its access basically is what you're doing yeah. is you're making impossible access for people who otherwise physically would never get the chance to sit and, and ghost someone else. It's funny that you should say that, Brian, because I mean, and you may be right. It's certainly you're right so far, but I always thought that the internet wouldn't come until its own until you started doing stuff that was internet native, that wasn't a virtualization mm. of the real world. That it wasn't, you know, magazines on the web or television or radio. I mean, clearly what we're doing is absolutely that. Uh, and a lot no, but, of what but, we do. But, but it, ultimately, but, won't it be the Internet generation that comes up with something that's sui generis, that's completely unique to the Internet? I, I don't think so. I think that I think that we're made of messy wetware that expects certain things. And I think that the more that we cater to giving our bodies, those things that we expect. Uh, you know, look at look at Dunbar's number, this idea that yeah. you can really only handle the concept of about 150 friends. That's why Facebook is huge because it allows you to isolate in on your own tribe. And even though it's an artificial construct, it's an, an abstraction, uh, it allows you to, to spread messages easier and feel part of something uh, tight while, while actually maintaining your role in the rest of society. I think that... Um, I think that the sooner that we all recognize the flawed, bizarre, uh, kludgy nature of, of our mechanics and that we figure out a way to, uh, do, uh, for example, uh, soldiers. There's a reason that soldiers and their heads up display looks like a video game because that's what we right. like to see. Is we want to see a video game. So so let's rather than try to retrain them with something new, let's let's just make it a video game. I And I and yeah, weirdly, I think it's OK. Yeah, or the metaphors that that we use now are is is television organic of us because we like to see stuff like you said the messy wetware of humanity or or is it just a very convenient thing that was developed in the mid 20th century that that just like you said Leo will eventually phase out and become something that is truly organic and of the web right is it is the medium really the message you guys say that biology is destiny we can't transcend Maybe. our meat sacks I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's we, we can right. certainly transcend the ambition of meat sacks just as we transcend our urges to rape and murder or whatever. You know, we can be better. Haven't than, done a great job of that yet, want. however. <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, you say that you say that. And yet, if you read uh, Stephen Pinker's Better Na Angels of Our Nature, uh, this is the most peaceful, most prosperous, uh, best time in the entire history of humanity. We have never as a creature been more peaceful really? or more beneficial beneficial than we are yeah. right now. Oh, by but, leaps and bounds. So we, I mean, it's so that's astonishing. That so that's Matt the Ridley question. Is, in all his analyses, is, too, that it's, is, uh, even though you hear all this horrible stuff on the news, you know, it's really just a percentage of a percentage, the bad things that true. happen. So we and certainly are more aware of the bad people. stuff. Yeah. And yet there's no question that 20th century was the most bloody in human history. So maybe this is, uh, I hope it's a new era or an interregnum 
a brief pause in between well, bloodbaths. I, I, again, um, uh, uh, the 20th century suffered from unfor an unfortunate uh, prevalence of industrial technology in a time, uh, you know, where it's like where war became mechanized yeah, at, at that point. That's right. But, yeah. but you'll notice right. since then, it's astonishing. It's astonishing and unprecedented. At no time in all of uh, humanity have have not only not only have we seen fewer deaths in war, but our taste for for torture and death is at an all time low. Uh, Steven Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature is utterly astonishing. It'll change your life. <laughs> Beatmaster hey, says, you obviously, new, Pinker uh, never saw a single YouTube comment section. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, but now, now, that's great. Like, let's let that be the new standard for what is hideous and gross in our lives. Yes. You know, the, uh, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. in, in Steven yeah. Pinker's book, he talks about how. For uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, uh, broken, broke on the wheel. I forget what the, what it is. They would basically take someone, take oh, yeah. a wagon wheel, Horrible. for amusement, break all their bones and yeah. weave their body through a wagon wheel and then spin it around. Like this is this is what humanity was built to do, and and it's great to me that we are transcending it for I hope he's trolling. Right. I'll take trolls any day. Yeah, no, that's minor compared to drawing, quartering, and things like that. We're going to take hey, a break. Leo get, Brian, yes. I know you guys are uh, Peter F. Hamilton fans. Have you read his new book? I just read Great I, North I, Road. What's his new one? Oh, that's what I mean. Great North Road. Yeah. 2012. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I am only a third of the way into it. Please tell me why I should get back into it because it seems like there's an awful lot of getting ready it's, to get ready. It's a long procedural. Very long. You liked it? Yeah. You liked it, Trey? <laughs> well, I wasn't going to talk about the, the plot points of the book, just more the vision of um, technology uh, fusing with humanism because it's not well, that's what Ham out that's really what Hamilton does though isn't it uh, yeah. yeah yeah so well I like it because it takes Ham place in Newcastle on Tyne and it's still this industrial gray snowy town but it also happens to be the gateway to a, a space uh, to a space tunnel that warps you to another planet I actually like Hamilton it you know what this brings up audible.com good time to mention the way I listen. Yeah. Where I read books these days is by listening, and that's how I listen to Great North Road. Very nicely narrated by P Toby Longworth, who does all the Peter F. Hamilton. Do you did you read it, Trey, or listen to it? No, I'm actually I'm about I'm exactly where uh, Brian is. I'm a third of the way through, and I was listening to it on my road trip. I yeah. love Audible. That's that was my latest book, so I was kind of excited about it. Yeah, I think it's great. Can I and, can I, can I reiterate my my deep held belief? That uh, that the best way to experience any kind of narrative fiction is by an audiobook, and I and I'll I'll I go agree with toe you. to toe with anyone who ch challenges me on this because you are for when I read, I'm using air quotes for that stupid translation of my eyes taking symbols and throwing gestalts in my brain. That's dumb and slow because it forces me to direct, and I'm a lousy director, and I cheat and I jump ahead. I read stuff before I'm supposed to. But when you are forced to listen to every word exactly the way the author intended it, you get a richer experience. Audible, Audible is the best way to experience all of the best stories. I don't even do, need to do an ad at this point. <laughs> but I'm with you 100%. No, I, I admit it's not for everybody. And I think, uh, you know, maybe you're saying, well, I don't know. I, I like to read books. I don't know if I can listen to a book. Maybe I'll lose track of what's going on or, you know, my attention will drift. So we invite you to try it. In fact, we've got a really good deal for twi uh, two books for free for the first month. Audible.com slash T-W-I-T and the number two. Uh, you'll be signing up for the Platinum account. That's the two books a month. That's what I'm a member of Platinum. and uh, Or two credits, but most books are a single credit. All the Peter F. Hamilton books are a single credit, and uh, despite the length. And that really allows you to, um, to, to get a sense of, is this right for me? So please, uh, get The Great North Road. Actually, I would... If I'm going to pick a single Peter F. Hamilton novel to start with, they don't have Dragonfall yet. I'm sure they're reading it right now. That's the the great Peter F. Hamilton for the first one. Maybe Pandora's Star. Uh, the Pandora's first. Star. Yeah. If you're going to pick one just to get yeah. started, I would I highly recommend good. Pandora's Greatness. Star. And then move on to the Void Trilogy. Yep. And you'll learn more about the bureaucracy of Carinchia than you'll ever want to know. <laughs> <laughs> in an entertaining way, I might have. Pandora's oh, yeah. Star, now, you can get that mind. and Judas Unchained for for free. That's a good yeah, deal. Yeah, keep in mind, like, like Hamilton's great strength is that he's able to take a future where it is an option to go post-physical, almost as a fashionable right. thing. Right. They're like, why do you still have a body? Why don't you just download your consciousness and live in the ether or whatever? And yet, 
he still knows what people are going to want to do. When they can go physical, what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to kick each other's ass <laughs> and have sex. That's the world. <laughs> Uh, so there you go. There you have it. Audible.com. It's not just sci-fi. History, fiction of all kinds, thrillers and mysteries and suspense. Classics, too. Really great way to, you know, you want to listen to Dickens? There's no better way to have Dickens come to life in your brain. The movie in your mind is amazing. Uh, there are over 150,000 titles. All the bestsellers show up on Audible immediately. Uh, of course, a lot of great kids stuff as well. Um, in fact, their young adult selection and their children's selection is excellent. A great way to get a child into reading. Please do yourself you what, a favor. I, I would like to. I would like to put a plug in for uh, Stephen Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nation. Is that on Audible? It's really astonishing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing. I, I believe it might be two credits. You'll have to take a look. It's a big book, but it's one of those things that just changes the way you see the world. And so often you you have these enlightening books that just make you depressed about the reality. Steven Pinker's book will make you believe that we're going to get this thing licked. We're going to get this figured That's out. Neat. And we're part of the I'm greatest team in humanity's history. Downloading it right now. By the way, they, this hey, is here's a another good suggestion for you guys. Yeah. If you want a major mind F, if you want to go sci-fi in a different direction, there's a Philip K. Dick book called Valis. Oh, yeah. Like, like yeah. Brian was saying about listening to an audio book, when you're inside PKD's head and he's reading or he's he doesn't read Valis, but when you're hearing it i mean it will do things to your brain that you might not be ready for but it is an amazing sci-fi experience i love this guy there's He's something very visual about philip k dick almost all of his books have been turned into classic sci-fi movies minority report uh, um uh, blade runner blade runner was based on when uh I'll do electric androids do androids dream yeah. of electric sheep. Android dream of electric yeah. sheep yeah uh he is very visual somehow so great yeah. stuff Total Recall is a Philip K. Dick short story, I think. Um, oh, boy, we just given him too many choices. Pick two <laughs> and get them for free. Audible.com slash twit2. We thank them for their support many years now of uh, twit and all of our uh, network shows. Snapchat hack. People say that Snapchat did not respond well to this. They confirmed a leak. 4.6 million usernames, but they did not apologize. We have to apologize, is that? <laughs> well, didn't they, it's, they it's ignore tough. the white I, hat, which is a bad move? So that's the big problem is this Gibson Security, not Steve Gibson, but an unrelated, um, did in fact say there is a is a hack. Um, the white Now, did the white hack hold it back? They went to Snapchat and told them about it, right? But this yeah, was, I think they held they, it back and Snapchat just didn't respond. Uh, and of course, uh, eventually, um, the bad guys found out. Um, and used it using the functionality of Find Friends to upload a large number of random phone numbers and then match them with Snapchat usernames. That uh, database of phone numbers and uh, usernames was released on New Year's Eve. Uh, they did, uh, what did they, obscured the last two digits. 4.6 million Snapchat users' phone numbers yeah, in the Snapchat chat DB... Um, now the bad guys said our motivation, they told the verge, our motivation behind the release was to raise public awareness around the issue and to put pressure on Snapchat to get this exploit fixed. So are the hackers white hats? I mean, I, I, I don't know as far as motivations or what, what the hackers were doing, but I could tell you this much. This is the beginning of what will be one of the defining yeah commodities of the 21st century, which is privacy. I mean, people will pay big, big money for guaranteed privacy. And of course, what we're seeing with uh, essentially th that's what Snapchat, of course, provides. I'm using air quotes for free is the ability to, you know, take a picture and know that it won't stick to your lifelong resume. Uh, and as stories like this come out, the value of a trusted brand or a trusted system yeah. for you for just one moment for just one moment do something that's not on your permanent record will become all the sweeter and more valuable to people you hit the right word there trust trust equity is the key to this story and and that is something where i i mean certainly no judgment on i, I don't run snapchat so i don't make their communications decisions but i i would say that they're 
reluctance or hesitance to to apologize in any way. This very hubristic uh, type of of balls forward answer. Uh, uh, that that is indicative of their philosophy going forward, and I think that that is something that uh, it's not going to kill the company. But trust is where consumers will make decisions going forward, and this ignores trust. This says us first, consumers second. You know, mistakes be damned. All you know, full speed ahead. Now, if if you if you like that tactical approach, then I think you have no problem with Snapchat. However, users will pay a premium for privacy. Forget stickers and buttons and that kind of stuff. Yeah, they'll pay for that. But what they'll really pay for is the trust equity and knowing that my data is secure and that my privacy, my personhood is taken seriously. And I think an answer like this is just... A uh, very interesting tactical response uh, to a process that kind of ignores trust at the center of that equation. I think yeah, I'm Dan, less. I think that. Go ahead, uh, Trey. Teenagers. I don't. I don't think the teenagers that use Snapchat even care. Um, you know, this stuff seems to happen all the time, and they might just change their password if they even hear about it. You know, I bet I mean, well, only two okay. percent of the 4.6 million people even even heard about it. The only people talking so, so, about it are people in the tech news. I, right, not the teenagers. If who they use don't Snapchat. care. If they don't care, I would wager that it's because they just don't understand the context, uh, not that they don't want the privacy that it affords. The reason they're on Snapchat to begin with is because they want privacy. And and to, to say they don't care, it's like I don't think that they go to Snapchat but don't care about privacy. I think it's they, they go and they just don't understand and I think or haven't. Oh, I'm mm. sorry to uh, a little lag there. I, I think you're you're absolutely right. They while, while it's easy, you know, we can all, all – all be teenagers and go, oh, they really don't care. It's just the tech press. I totally agree that it's just the tech press talking about that, but they will care when the last two digits of their parents' phone number or their phone number leaks out and their parents find out about it or somebody who holds them accountable. Forget parents. Let's just use accountability here, right? So somebody who is going to hold that dick pic accountable to you, then you care on a micro level. Yeah, on a macro level, this probably doesn't affect Snapchat too much, but it does on a micro and a granular level when there is consequence to behavior and leaking something like this is inevitable. Mistakes happen. Failure to apologize or to be accountable for your own complicity in this leaking, at some point, some company will be held accountable by their users. I'm less, I'm less upset by the fact they didn't apologize than by the fact they didn't fix it. Yeah. That's, that's actually more serious. They are we'll releasing apologize. a new version of Snapchat where you can opt out of this flawed fine friends and they are rate limiting it so you can't, you know, the bad guy can't download as many as fast, but they have not changed the API which has the flaw in it. Man, so, uh, that's, that's tough because uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, Leo, but like if they were to fix it, then at some level they are admitting that they're in the privacy business. And I believe up till this point, they haven't traded on privacy as one of their bedrock foundations. Um, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's, it seems like that's, that's a difficult promise to make, especially given in this, uh, you know, this NSA prevalent era of 2013 that we just experienced yeah so on christmas eve gibson security publicly documented the api this was security by obscurity that snapchat was using no one knew this hole existed so we didn't worry about it gibson released it is gibson at fault they told snapchat about it in august as is often the case white hats sometimes get uh irritated when a company doesn't fix it and then they start Telling more, poking sure. I don't. I don't know exactly who I blame, but it feels to me like the first thing Snapchat should do is fix it. That seems like more than an apology. That's what I'd like to see. Um, I don't know. You know, I have to ask my son and daughter. Use Snapchat a lot. I'll do an informal survey to see if they've ever even heard of so, this. I, and I bet and they actually, haven't. this is this this is a weird space for me to even put my mind in because uh, and people are like oh snapchat that's for taking photos of boobies and sending them it's, but it's not like, it's really not it's, it's not it's, it's a it's a it's a no, place it's linear where it's safe to do things right. that you'll regret not even that i think my the way my kids use it and i've observed them using it is it's the problem with stuff like twitter and facebook is it lives on they want a place right. where they could take a picture that doesn't that not because they want to hide anything but that doesn't have all that import to it. It doesn't have right. to be important. It could be a goofy picture. 
and that's fine. Yeah, I agree with Leo. I bet that's the vast majority of the pictures because I, I don't use it, but uh, I have a good friend that uses it. He's a dad. And he's got three daughters, and they use it all the time, of course, but he just takes fun pictures yeah. of things, and he sends it to them, and the pictures are just a little special, I guess, because they're ephemeral. You know, and they get to hold down and say, oh, my dad sent me something special. It's a little different than a Facebook, but as far as this whole trust thing goes, I think there's just general confusion or people don't really think about it because... Like, let's say the, the difference, let's say, that between Snapchat and Facebook is that face, Facebook keeps a copy of everything on their servers, where Snapchat supposedly doesn't. But well, that's it, does that really matter supposedly if they don't. the NSA has a copy of both? I, I'm I not guess, worried okay, about so, the NSA, and I think many people are not so worried about the NSA. And it does it does come down to, to I think, trust. I, I'm critiquing their communication strategy, but I think that this communicates to a lot of people. No, maybe to, not to the teenagers who, who are using – Leo, you said import, right? That is, that is the best way of putting it. There's just not a lot of weight on the content that I'm sharing. But that doesn't matter when it comes down to, you know – there may be so much velocity in Snapchat that it is unstoppable at this point. But, but you know, allegedly, maybe, I don't know, storing or not storing or keeping or not keeping. I, at some point, the weight of not trusting and not knowing and not having a, a explicit statement that we do not store things, we delete things, this is gone. Like 4chan, it is, when it's off the front page, it is gone. That is far more trustworthy of a statement than... Screw you. It happened. Right. Moving on. Some some uh, security se experts say that there's no safe way to implement a find friends feature, that that is inherently problematic. So in order to respond to this, Snapchat would have to remove the feature entirely. And that's something they're not willing to do because it is a big important part of this is to enter the phone, your phone number. And then what Snapchat does is it looks for your phone number in your friend's contact list to see if they know e you know each other. And that kind of uh, functionality is inherently risky. So Snapchat would actually have to delete that from their capability. We've seen problems with the path had the same problem. Upload your... Yeah, or just say, guys, this is how we do it. Don't have an expectation of privacy. Right. Ah, uh, Maybe that's it. And, and I, frankly, I, 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 I don't know. It's, maybe it's, my it's, kids I, don't I, that care. That undermines their core business model. Well, maybe it, their core business okay. model isn't privacy. Maybe it's the ability yeah, to exchange right. low import or, photos. Yeah, yeah. I, I should say maybe not their business model, but their value proposition to the consumer, maybe. right? And maybe that's why I find this 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 lack of apology kind of detestable. And that, like, well, look, you're what you are offering me goes is counter to the hack that happened. I can trust you if you say, look, we're not entirely private, and yeah, we made mistakes. We're working on it. We're going to fix it. That's a trustworthy statement. But simply saying, nope, our value proposition is that you stay private, but. Except when we need your data. Right. I mean, when you start adding accepts to something, then, then you know, exceptions run the game, run the table. We're going to run through a couple of uh, top stories very quickly, including a new Kanye West-themed cryptocurrency called Coinye West. This is not a joke. <laughs> Just Tell a me moment. Dogecoin is worth more. That's uh, all I, I want to know. I think Dogecoin's worth a lot. And by the way, I do want to find out when we come back how to pronounce that, because I don't know. Doggy. You see, therein lies the problem. Our show today brought to you by Gazelle.com. One thing I know for sure, that gadget or doodad in your desk drawer or your closet is not getting more valuable. It's getting dusty, and it's time to go to Gazelle.com and get rid of it for money. Whether you have an old iPhone or a BlackBerry, an HTC, LG, Motorola, Nokia, or Samsung phone, Gazelle is a chance for you to sell your old stuff Get actual money for it so you can get the new stuff. You've got an old S3, maybe you want to get a uh, a new uh, S4, get 100 bucks for your old S3 from Gazelle. Now, here's the beauty part. You're going to get a quote. That's good for 30 days. You don't even have to pull the trigger. You can, if you're thinking about getting a Surface Pro, maybe you, two, maybe you don't know, but you want to get rid of your old Surface Pro, Gazelle will give you a quote and lock it in for a full 30 days, giving you time to... Decide whether you want to get it, get the product, transfer your data over, and then send it to Gazelle. They'll send you a Leo, box. Is, it, is, is that true even, even when we're about to see, like, some big Apple announcement? Now's that, the time, That just yeah. seems like, yeah, it seems like anytime you know you're 
within 30 days of some kind of announcement. Just, just do go it. ahead and just, yeah, just, just do just it. Yeah. <laughs> um, they even buy broken iPhones and iPods. So there's a lot of people out there with cracked devices. They will take that. They, 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 they can use it. Here's, your, here's the deal. Go to gazelle.com. Find out what your stuff is worth. When you decide to pull the trigger, they will send you a box prepaid mailer that you don't have to pay the postage. And when your device gets there, their experts will go over it see what condition it's in. They'll even raise the value if it's in better condition than you thought it was. If you forget to wipe your data, no fear. They'll do it for you. And then they'll send you a check. You can get PayPal if you need it right away. They'll, and this is my tip. If you buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, get the Amazon gift card. They'll bump it up 5%. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. That's the place to go. If you've got old gadgets you want to get rid of and get some cash for, Gazelle has now spent over $100 million dollars They've sent money out to over 700,000 customers for their old gadgets at Gazelle. Coinye <laughs> West. Uh, it is a cryptocurrency. I think it's based on the same technology that, is it Doge, Dogi, Daga, Dae? How do you pronounce that Dogecoin? I say Doge. You I say Doge, uh, but I don't sir. know. You're, you're in New Zealand. How do you say it? I always said doggy because I thought the, the background of it was involved with it's that dogs meme. in some way. It's that meme. You know, there was a I can has cheeseburger cat. Yeah. And then doggy or doge or doge. How do you pronounce it? What is the urban? Know your meme. What do they say? Do they give you a pronunciation? There you go. A slang term for dog used to refer to, uh, let's see, primarily associated with pictures of Shiba Inus. Shiba Inos, Shiba. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are those. Uh, that's the internet dog. <laughs> uh, basically, basically, play that you video because it's from dog. Homestar yeah. Runner. Maybe the video will right. give us some a, a tip here. <laughs> I saw puppets. So this must be educational. Biz Cass Fry. I like the bad Casio music. Yeah, it's Homestar puppets. Ah. I'm almost uh, done with these third quarter projection analysis spreadsheets and still no sign of... What is up, my dog? Oh, dog? I'm not your dog. Wonderman, you quack me up. Quack me up. That's why you're my D-O-G-E. Your doge? What are you talking uh -oh. about? Uh-oh. Is it I doge? I'm bad. Rodelman works in regional shipping management resources. <laughs> good one, Rodelman. I mean, and this is why one. I hate YouTube I right there. So uh, that's Doge, I think. <laughs> I think we're gonna go with Doge. <laughs> Fine, good enough, good enough for me. But uh, but uh, I guess the meme for those of you who haven't seen it is basically you got this um, man. I'm gonna use the word Gestalt again. Like like what's going in the dog's mind at any given moment based on the picture. Right. But uh, somebody made a currency based on it because apparently you can make a currency out of anything. Which to be honest, I think is kind of rad. I'm pro yeah, making currency sure. out of stupid things. It's using I presume the the Litecoin technology that Dogecoin is using. Uh, I think Coinye West is also using. We did a a, a piece on the know how. Robert Balliser, didn't he, on how to build your own Dogecoin miner, which probably could be used for yeah, Coinier it's a, West? It, it's a three-part piece, so they're going to keep coming yeah. back to it to tell you how to how to mine uh, Doge or any any sort of cryptocurrency over time, better and better and better, and what to upgrade and what to swap out. Coinier oh West abused January 11th. No word about when Kim Coin is coming out. <laughs> the chat room is blowing up with suggestions of us making Twit's own currency, oh. Schwood coins, Brian Bucks. Yeah, because we've <laughs> joked about this on all of our other programs. I, I don't you know. You already got your dollars? own wine. I would say go for it. <laughs> go for it. NSFW Man, that coin. That would be pretty amazing. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think BB coin. <laughs> yeah, why not, man? Let's do it. You know, Bitcoin, bucks. Bitcoin tumbled when China announced that it was going to put restrictions on Bitcoin. But it's come back. It is now over 1000 bucks again, according to Mt. Gox. Yeah. I don't do understand you think, this what if, at all. What if... Uh, what if Bitcoin was meant to be a pump and dump scheme? I think it ended is. ended up succeeding beside itself. What if, Dan says, as if that's in question? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I mean, the origin, as we all know, the origin of Bitcoin is actually really fascinating. A lot of people think it was the NSA or a consortium of the NSA. And, it, you know, a, a friend of mine from Blip TV and I over the summer, he and I had, uh, created a, a little Bitcoin application that lets you send things to each other. And, and in that process, did a lot of uh, research into the guts of Bitcoin. And, yeah, what if? Yeah. Definitely. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, the person or persons who created Bitcoin, yeah. presumably right. has 
a lot of Bitcoin hanging out yeah. in their pocket. Because like any pyramid scheme, the, the earlier you got in on Bitcoin, the more likely you were yep. to generate coins. Steve Gibson, who was only a couple of years ago, did his first Bitcoin mining. He got 50 Bitcoins like that. That's well, 50. the Winkleby twins have... They've been investing. Know, like, yeah, they have like 20% of the market. They say it's going to be worth $40,000 in their dreams. Yeah. Big, I mean, the My problem is Bitcoin could go to zero Reddit. just like that. Have you seen yeah, the Reddit but, but, yeah, the so, so, so everything could. I don't know. Yeah. There, there's almost it's an fun. honesty to it. At least you know. Uh, the the problem with, with dollars is that you're, you have them based on the fantasy that there's a magical grandfather that's going to make sure they're worth something. At least yeah, with Bitcoin, yeah. you know you're buying nothing. You know it's honest. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, bro, right. you're, buying no, you're buying a number. Good luck. Hopefully right. that number will be worth something. I know you're a libertarian, but I mean, it isn't exactly a magical grandfather. It's called the U.S. government. Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, until <laughs> until that guy falls down, and he, just explain that to I mean, my Confederate dollars. All right, okay, hoarding. okay, all right. <laughs> Speaking of which, you can now use Bitcoin to pay for virtual goods, virtual money for virtual goods, and Farmville, Cityville, and other web gains. Zynga has made a deal with BitPay, so now you got something you could do with your Bitcoin. You could buy. Tell you what, imaginary Bit goods. BitPay makes it real easy. Uh, we started accepting Bitcoin on scamstuff.com just through BitPay. It's uh, Shopify offers it, and you just yeah, click Shopify. a button, and you're like, yeah, I'll take your And they send you cash? Money. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. They, they immediately, the moment they do the transaction, they translate it to U.S. dollars and throw it in your account. See, in my, I, so we take Bitcoin donations on our front page, and I'm just, my attitude is it's free money. I'm just going to, we got seven Bitcoins so yeah. far. I just hold it, right? I yeah. sold out. I I cashed in at a grand. I bought mine at at under forty dollars. Oh, and, you made And when money. it hit a grand, it was like, nope. Um, that's and that money was real money. I spent it with real hands. But won't, won't you feel stupid when if a Bitcoin gets to ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars? No, because I cashed in at a thousand dollars with real cash money in my hands. <laughs> Okay, no, okay, now stop using that term real cash money. What you're saying in effect is I got rid of right, those imaginary things for these imaginary things. Yes, but those right. imaginary things those... can be paid, can used to pay your taxes, yes. can be used all around the world to buy, you know, oil. I mean, there, there, there is some, admittedly, it's all fiat it's currency. It's all imaginary, Brian, but... Some are more imaginary than others. <laughs> I mean, some 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 have a longer track record. But if we're going to play that game, then all of a sudden we're back to yes, like, right. why are we giving yes. gold ingots to each other? Yeah, yeah. Uh, cash right. machines the, the being fear that the Bitcoin bot was not. Say again. In fact, Brian, I'll play this with you. What is he doing? Oh, I, in fact, I I'll use some of that Bitcoin money brian to drink a real beer with you and then we can babble about this all night because i love oh this my god argument. this sounds awesome dude you, you you had me at beer this sounds awesome let's go in the uh, also on vicodin and beer <laughs> yes That's scary and and valtrex don't forget my anti-herpes medicine you're feeling good no, silk road is down is it <laughs> Um, so in 1964 at the world's fair which i remember very well i was i think six or seven no i was eight years old and I remember AT&T had the picture phone. You know, someday, by the year 1970, you will be talking on picture phones. They asked Isaac Asimov what the world would look like in 50 years. He wrote in the New York Times that by now, 2014, gadgetry will continue to relieve mankind of tedious jobs. Kitchen units will be devised that prepare auto meals, heating water and converting it to coffee, toasting bread, frying, poaching, or scrambling eggs, grilling bacon, and so on. Breakfast will be ordered the night before to be ready by a specified hour the next morning. Did they and not have toasters and back then? <laughs> Didn't happen. But now this one did. Communications will become sight sound. You will see as well as hear the person you telephone. The screen can not only be used to see the people you call, but also for studying documents and photographs and reading passages from books. Synchronous satellites hovering in space will make it possible for you to direct dial any spot on the Earth, including weather stations in Antarctica. Undersea cables, but same thing. Men so, will continue to withdraw from nature in order to create an environment that will suit them better. By 2014, electroluminescent panels will be in common use. Ceilings and walls will glow softly in a variety of colors 
that will change at the touch of a button. Robots will be neither <laughs> robots will be neither common nor very good in 2014, but they will be in existence. That's right. The I guess I think that may, might be my favorite of his predictions in that it was accurate in that the way it constrained itself, that it right. didn't make a blanket yeah. like, we'll all have magic robots doing everything. The fact that he specifically said, uh, you, we will see the rudiments uh, by, by this point. Right. The appliances of 2014 will have no electric cords, of course, for they will be powered by long-lived batteries running on radioisotopes. <laughs> <laughs> Highways well. will have passed their peak by 2014, and there'll be increased emphasis on transportation that makes the least possible contact with surface. Even ground travel will increasingly take to the air a foot or two off the ground. <laughs> All right, you can see how hard it is to figure the future. He did nail one thing. The world population will be 6.5 billion. The population of the U.S. will be 350 million. Almost on the nose. Yeah. I guess you could kind of predict that. It's pretty. It's a pretty uh, consistent your growth. Yeah. No. Well, I, I I would actually say not because uh, one of the biggest stories of the last ten years has been the um, the popular prediction uh, in the nineteen sixties. If you read uh, the population bomb or whatever, it was like we're all screwed. There's going to be thirteen million and we're all going to die. But for him to predict essentially the leveling off of populations. Uh, specifically both in the United States and worldwide, I think was was a really good one. I wish these guys, uh, Arthur C. Clarke did the same and Walter Cronkite. I wish uh, we could get Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov at uh, today's CES and just hear what they think. <laughs> uh, hey, it's So I got a question for you. Yes. Hey, hold on. But before we wrap up here, because I've been, I've been thinking about, um, you know, I don't know, you, you, New Year, we're all getting older or whatever, closer to, to death. dying and becoming death. Yeah. Yep. Death. Yep. I said death. Uh, the uh, uh, here's what is exciting about in all of human history: the fact that we live in this generation. One thing that sticks with me is if I could trade right now, just going back 20 years, would you trade your degraded sense of health, but in exchange have to give up the technology that we've seen for any amount of time? Like, would you be 20 years younger but give up? Your uh, the last twenty years of advancement in technology. Nope. Yep. I mean, and 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 the reverse of that is how excited am I to become sixty and then eighty years old? Yeah. Knowing that concurrent with that, I'll get all the complete dope ass advancements that we're gonna get. <laughs> I'm going to be 60 in three years, Brian. It's <laughs> no yeah. fun at all. Dude, I, okay. Now, now, would you trade? Would you trade? I mean, let's say, uh, and, and this is serious. Uh, would you go back to, so what, you're 57, so you, would you go back to, to 37, looking like me, uh, but- Can I look like you? Give up. That, well, yes, you you can only look like me. That's that's the the penalty. Uh, <laughs> you would have to give up uh, the iPhone. You'd have to give up broadband. You'd have to give up the Twit Studio. You'd have to. I, I mean, would would yep. you? Uh, but didn't he actually already do that twenty years ago? <laughs> <laughs> Did they have Viagra twenty years ago? I'm curious. No, it was it was it was it was brand new. <laughs> do you have to give up? I think like ninety eight. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> what fun. I don't know. I That's a very good question. I think as you get older, sometimes uh, the thought of going back in time, even if you had to relive all of the technological advances of the last 20 years one by one, I would still do it. I'd like to. I don't know, though. I love the fact that I'm living in the future. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Isn't that not Get cool? on me, man. Yeah. If, at if, at if, no if, time in human history, in the, all of humanity have we had the ability to get to know each other better as humans yeah. over time yeah. this is this is the greatest time in all of history because we can humans are inherently social we are inherently drawn together and now we have the tools we've created the tools to facilitate us getting to know each other better over time not degrading our friendships and relationships as we grow and mature i i now have the opportunity to know my friends and my family in ways that that my ancestors never did and that alone yeah. is is worth everything i just hope i may i'd like to make it another 20 or 30 years because i'm excited about what we might see in the next 20. i think the singularity is close i'd like to be there for that you think it's near do you think we'll have Ger it in our lifetime? Oh, but Jaron Lanier says we don't want that, right? He has very interesting reasoning. Yeah, Jaron's an interesting fella. 
<laughs> I'm not well, sure I agree you with them. To, to echo what Dan and, and Brian were saying, and there was that one last Asimov prediction that you didn't get to, which was kind of very weird prediction that there would be this major disease of boredom. Yeah. And actually, yeah. I think something that he didn't foresee, which is a kind of innovative way that we've all ended up using technology and smartphones and everything, um, it actually has made us more human because two of yeah. the key aspects to being human are being um, curious and communicating with fellow humans. And all this technology basically allows us, allows our curiosity to go crazy right. and allows us to communicate better and in new ways uh, than ever before. So uh, this, this idea of boredom actually, uh, actually drives a lot of what we do and has ended up making us more human. So I'm with you guys. I think we're at the perfect time in the perfect place. Yeah, I really wouldn't want to be anywhere else. It's been fun. Thank you, guys. Trey Ratcliffe, you're the greatest. Look forward to finding out more about the Arcanum. It's at thearcanum.com and, of course, Trey's website, stuckincustoms.com, and he's always posting great stuff on Google+, Facebook, and elsewhere. Nice to see you again, Trey. Good to see you, Leo. Thanks. Thank you so much. Dan Patterson is uh, doing all sorts of interesting stuff, soon to uh, head to... The Middle East to teach people how to yeah. use encryption to protect them. Journalists how to use encryption to protect themselves and their sources online. What a great thing that is, Dan. Well, it was great to be here, Leo. And and uh, Trey and Brian, it was really great to, to meet you and uh, talk with you this evening. So fun. We'll have you back real soon. TanukiLabs.com. And uh, looks like, sh looks like uh, we got Trey Ratcliffe's family in there. Hey. Hi, everybody. Oh, what? Hey. Now we're Say hello, Uncle Leo. <laughs> I'm going to have a contest. I need to get my kids get in Get your here. kids in there. Do they love New Zealand? Do they have a great Christmas? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's really fun. Dad. He got an Xbox hey, One. Is it, is it weird? You got an Xbox is it weird One? Having, wow. Is it weird having Christmas in the summer? Like, is that messing you guys up? Yeah, it's super freaky. It's it's because it's, it's bright oh until midnight here. And so you never get to see the Christmas lights. You have to come in at 3 a.m. to see the Christmas lights. <laughs> that takes some of the fun out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trey, it's great to see you and your wonderful family down there in Queenstown, New Zealand. It's a, this, cool. And look, this is amazing. I mean, we're what, 15,000 miles separated or something? I don't know even what the right. distance is. But here we are. We're talking in real time. I'm seeing the family. We could have a conversation like this. Uh, it's great. Dan Patterson's in New York City. Brian Brushwood in Austin, Texas. It's great to have you. I guess all. that's the thing. Like, like uh, uh, it's weird. Uh, I I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, Justin and I, when we started doing before NSFW BB Live Show, I would say in the first two years of our online trying to do comedy experience, we saw each other physically maybe five, six times. Wow. And that's it. Like, like, like it was weird to meet him in person and be, <laughs> you know, someone who I. You know, regarded as one of my closest friends, and I'm like, oh, that's right. You have that thing on your eyebrow. I, I, how did I not know that? <laughs> we live weird. in very hey, interesting like, times. Tommy in the mail. What's that? Oh, I got mine too. We're excited. Uh, yeah. We're excited. The new Daniel <laughs> Suarez book. I'll ride the pony. All yeah. Right. We're going to get Daniel on to talk about it on triangulation. I got mine too. It comes out in uh, about a month. That's not Audible yet, right? No. No, it's not even out yet. Yeah. No, Doesn't exist until Audible. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know what? It's uh, uh, John just read it. It's called Influx, and it sounds really good. I love the premise, which is that we've already discovered all those amazing things. Fusion power, genetic enhancements, artificial intelligence, cure for disease, extended human life. But there's this Bureau of Technology Control that keeps a lid on it. Because they didn't think it would upset society too much. The future is already here. Maybe Asimov was Man, right. That's a, that sounds like a book like isn't Brian that, Brushwood would write. Isn't that a premise? Crazy libertarian uh, crap. I love that. <laughs> Those gosh darn government bureaucrats. And once again, <laughs> holding us back. More Bitcoin. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You can catch Brian on NSFW every week right here. Do watch his uh, New Year's Eve show. I'm a little biased because I was on it, but that was an awfully fun show. A lot of fun. And uh, we'll see you. You're, you're still on Tuesday, right? You haven't moved. No. Right. Everything's good. And don't forget, the same. Don't and forget the comedy schools. records, the number one comedy records in the world, the Scam School store where you can buy stuff like lockpicks, 
and other yeah. sh- other stuff. All kinds of scamstuff.com, but more importantly, uh, uh, Night Attack 1, Night Attack 2, and Night Attack Live. Uh, this was, uh, 2013 was an amazing year, Leo, and I've said this before, said it on the live stream, but uh, I'm so thankful that NSFW has been made available to us as a platform for Justin and I to try to work out our, our comedy ramblings that seem to uh, do do fairly well, and I owe it all to you. Thanks. It's very man. funny. <laughs> where can is it on? It's on iTunes, right? Sure. Is Same that where is that where you prefer we'd buy it? Uh, uh I don't care. Amazon. Uh, yeah, Amazon's fine. Go to go to Amazon. Just look up Night Attack. You'll hear hilarious stories of me frolicking naked in a fountain in downtown Austin. Not for the children. Not for the weak of mind. It is explicit. Yes, for the weak of mind. That's what I call my children. I'm sorry. You are of the weak of mind. Right, I'm just going to read you the titles of the first night attack. Mexican Hitler, High yep. Stakes, with an EA, Fat yes. Kid Justin, Back yep. to Mexican Hitler, and then Sweating to the Fuhrer. <laughs> Stuck on a theme. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it goes on. Uncle Bilbo missed call. It's, it goes on. There's more of the same. If, you, uh, yeah. Let's man, put it this I'd way. Almost to... If twerking bothers you, you shouldn't be able to get night attack too. Yeah, probably not. No. Probably not. Hobo Joe, Johnny Jerk, special massage. <laughs> I'm in that one. <laughs> Do you know it's special massage, by the way, just or, uh, I'll just tell you I, what the hell I'll tell you. Special massage is the painfully awkward tale of when I went to do a TV special in uh, Indonesia, and they had uh, uh, they had a massage parlor upstairs, and the awkward, uh, almost angry negotiations in which someone gave me a high pressure sale. You want for special a massage? Happy you want special yes, massage? Exactly. No, I'm, no that I'm was, not. I just was, want to was, relax. No, you want special massage. Exactly. So like, you're very strong. I was like, okay. That's, <laughs> no. I, I fist like monkey. You want special <laughs> massage. <laughs> Can we call this episode fist like monkey? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. We do twit. We haven't moved twit. We'll continue to do it Sunday afternoons, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time 2300 UTC on twit.tv. Please join us live. Love it if you do. But of course, we make on demand audio and video of all of our shows available after the fact on our website, twit.tv, or wherever finer netcasts are aggregated and distributed to you via the internet, such as iTunes. Um, I'll be gone tomorrow. Going to go to the New Media Expo. If you happen to be in Vegas, come by, say hi. Otherwise, um, I'll see you Tuesday. What? You're going to stream my uh, my uh, panels? Oh, good. 9 a.m. Tomorrow? Oh, God. Uh, Another twit. It's <laughs> in the can. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit, baby. And, gentlemen, I am ready to go to Vegas. Oh! <laughs> I have my... I have my brain mask ready to go to Vegas. I will be wearing this on the airplane. You think the TSA will... I'm sure you're wondering yes, why you're wearing man. this mask. I live in the darkness. Ah. Oh. <sighs> That's pretty nice. Nice I job. I am twits reckoning. <laughs> Gotham is dead. Whoa.